This is Audible. Audible Inc. and Harlequin present The Iron King, written by Julie Kagawa, read by Christine Vam. Part One. Chapter One. The Ghost in the Computer. Ten years ago, on my sixth birthday, my father disappeared. No, he didn't leave. Leaving would imply suitcases and empty drawers and late birthday cards with ten-dollar bills stuffed inside. Leaving would imply he was unhappy with mom and me, or that he found a new love elsewhere. None of that was true. He also did not die, because we would have heard about it. There was no car crash, no body, no police mingling about the scene of a brutal murder. It all happened very quietly. On my sixth birthday, my father took me to the park, one of my favorite places to go at that time. It was a lonely little park in the middle of nowhere, with a running trail and a misty green pond surrounded by pine trees. We were at the edge of the pond feeding the ducks when I heard the jingle of an ice cream truck in the parking lot over the hill. When I begged my dad to get me a creamsicle, he laughed, handed me a few bills, and sent me after the truck. That was the last time I saw him. Later, when the police searched the area, they discovered his shoes at the edge of the water, but nothing else. They sent divers into the pond, but it was barely ten feet down, and they found nothing but branches and mud at the bottom. My father had disappeared without a trace. For months afterward, I had a recurring nightmare about standing at the top of that hill, looking down and seeing my father walk into the pond. As the water closed over his head, I could hear the ice cream truck singing in the background, a slow, eerie song with words I could almost understand. Every time I tried to listen to them, however, I'd wake up. Not long after my father's disappearance, Mom moved us far away to a tiny little hick town in the middle of the Louisiana Bayou. Mom said she wanted to start over, but I always knew deep down that she was running from something. It would be another ten years before I discovered what. My name is Megan Chase. In less than twenty-four hours, I'll be sixteen years old. Sweet sixteen, it has a magical ring to it. Sixteen is supposed to be the age when girls become princesses and fall in love and go to dances and proms and such. Countless stories, songs, and poems have been written about this wonderful age, when a girl finds true love and the stars shine for her, and the handsome prince carries her off into the sunset. I didn't think it would be that way for me. The morning before my birthday, I woke up, showered, and rummaged through my dresser for something to wear. Normally, I just grab whatever clean-ish thing is on the floor, but today was special. Today was the day Scott Waldron would finally notice me. I wanted to look perfect. Of course, my wardrobe is sadly lacking in the popular attire department. While other girls spend hours in front of their closets crying, "What should I wear?" My drawers basically hold three things. Clothes from Goodwill, hand-me-downs, and overalls. I wish we weren't so poor. I know pig farming isn't the most glamorous of jobs, but you'd think Mom could afford to buy me at least one pair of nice jeans. I glared at my scanty wardrobe in disgust. Oh well, I guess Scott will have to be wowed with my natural grace and charm if I don't make an idiot of myself in front of him. I finally slipped into cargo pants, a neutral green T-shirt, and my only pair of ratty sneakers before dragging a brush through my white blonde hair. My hair is straight. And very fine, and was doing that stupid floating thing again, where it looked like I jammed my finger up an electrical outlet. Yanking it into a ponytail, I went downstairs. Luke, my stepfather, sat at the table drinking coffee and leafing through the town's tiny newspaper, which reads more like our high school gossip column than a real news source. Five-legged calf born on Patterson's farm. The front page screamed. You get the idea. Ethan, my four-year-old half brother, sat on his father's lap, eating a pop tart and getting crumbs all over Luke's overalls. He clutched Floppy, his favorite stuffed rabbit, in one arm, and occasionally tried to feed it his breakfast. 
The rabbit's face was full of crumbs and fruit filling. Ethan is a good kid. He has his father's curly brown hair, but, like me, inherited mom's big blue eyes. He's the type of kid old ladies stop to coo at, and total strangers smile and wave at him from across the street. Mom and Luke dote on their baby, but it doesn't seem to spoil him, thank goodness. Where's mom? I asked as I entered the kitchen. Opening the cabinet doors, I scoured the boxes of cereal for the one I liked, wondering if mom remembered to pick it up. Of course, she hadn't. Nothing but fiber squares and disgusting marshmallow cereals for Ethan. Was it so hard to remember Cheerios? Luke ignored me and sipped his coffee. Ethan chewed his Pop-Tart and sneezed on his father's arm. I slammed the cabinet doors with a satisfying bang. Where's mom? I asked, a bit louder this time. Luke jerked his head up and finally looked at me. His lazy brown eyes, like those of a cow, registered mild surprise. Oh, hello, Meg, he said calmly. I didn't hear you come in, would you say? I sighed and repeated my question for the third time. She had a meeting with some of the ladies at church, Luke murmured, turning back to his paper. She won't be back for a few hours, so you'll have to take the bus. I always took the bus. I just wanted to remind Mom that she was supposed to take me to get a learner's permit this weekend. With Luke, it was hopeless. I could tell him something 14 different times, and he'd forget it the moment I left the room. It wasn't that Luke was mean or malicious or even stupid. He adored Ethan, and Mom seemed truly happy with him. But every time I spoke to my stepdad, he would look at me with genuine surprise, as if he'd forgotten I lived here, too. I grabbed a bagel from the top of the fridge and chewed it sullenly, keeping an eye on the clock. Bo, our German shepherd, wandered in and put his big head on my knee. I scratched him behind the ears and he groaned. At least the dog appreciated me. Luke stood, gently placing Ethan back in his seat. All right, big guy, he said, kissing the top of Ethan's head. Dad has to fix the bathroom sink, so you sit there and be good. When I'm done... We'll go feed the pigs, okay? Okay, Ethan chirped, swinging his chubby legs. Floppy wants to see if Miss Daisy had her babies yet. Luke's smile was so disgustingly proud, I felt nauseous. Hey, Luke, I said as he turned to go. Bet you can't guess what tomorrow is. Mmm. He didn't even turn around. I don't know, Meg. If you have plans for tomorrow, talk to your mother. He snapped his fingers, and Bo immediately left me to follow him. Their footsteps faded up the stairs, and I was alone with my half-brother. Ethan kicked his feet, regarding me in that solemn way of his. I know, he announced softly, putting his Pop-Tart on the table. Tomorrow's your birthday, isn't it? Floppy told me, and I remembered. Yeah, I muttered, turning and lobbing the bagel into the trash can. It hit the wall with a thump and dropped inside, leaving a greasy smear on the paint. I smirked and decided to leave it. Floppy says to tell you happy early birthday. Tell Floppy thanks. I ruffled Ethan's hair as I left the kitchen, my mood completely soured. I knew it. Mom and Luke would completely forget my birthday tomorrow. I wouldn't get a card or a cake or even a happy birthday from anyone except my kid brother's stupid stuffed rabbit. How pathetic was that? Back in my room, I grabbed books, homework, gym clothes, and the iPod I'd spent a year saving for, despite Luke's disdain of those useless, brain-numbing gadgets. In true hick fashion, my stepfather dislikes and distrusts anything that could make life easier. Cell phones? No way, we've got a perfectly good landline. Video games? They're the devil's tools, turning kids into delinquents and serial killers. I've begged Mom over and over to buy me a laptop for school, but Luke insists that if his ancient, clunky PC is good enough for him, it's good enough for the family. Never mind that dial-up takes flipping forever. I mean, who uses dial-up anymore? I checked my watch and swore. The bus would arrive shortly, and I had a good ten-minute walk to the main road. Looking out the window, I saw the sky was gray and heavy with rain, so I grabbed a jacket as well. And, not for the first time, I wished we lived closer to town. I swear when I get a license in a car, I am never coming back to this place.
Maggie? Ethan hovered in the doorway, clutching his rabbit under his chin. His blue eyes regarded me somberly. Can I go with you today? What? Shrugging into my jacket, I gazed around for my backpack. No, Ethan, I'm going to school now. Big kid's school. No rugrats allowed. I turned away, only to feel two small arms wrap around my leg. Putting my hand against the wall to avoid falling, I glared down at my half-brother. Ethan clung to me doggedly, his face tilted up to mine, his jaw set. Please, he begged. I'll be good, I promise. Take me with you, just for today. With a sigh, I bent down and picked him up. What's up, Squirt? I asked, brushing his hair out of his eyes. Mom would need to cut it soon. It was starting to look like a bird's nest. You're awfully clingy this morning. What's going on? Scared, Ethan muttered, burying his face in my neck. You're scared? He shook his head. Floppy scared. What's Floppy scared of? The man in the closet. I felt a small chill slide up my back. Sometimes Ethan was so quiet and serious, it was hard to remember he was only four. He still had childish fears of monsters under his bed and boogeymen in his closet. In Ethan's world, stuffed animals spoke to him, invisible men waved to him from the bushes, and scary creatures tapped long nails against his bedroom window. He rarely went to Mom or Luke with stories of monsters and boogeymen. From the time he was old enough to walk, he always came to me. I sighed, knowing he wanted me to go upstairs and check, to reassure him that nothing lurked in his closet or under his bed. I kept a flashlight on his dresser for that very reason. Outside, lightning flickered, and thunder rumbled in the distance. I winced. My walk to the bus was not going to be pleasant. Damn it, I don't have time for this. Ethan pulled back and looked at me, eyes pleading. I sighed again. Fine, I muttered, putting him down. Let's go check for monsters. He followed me silently up the stairs, watching anxiously as I grabbed the flashlight and got down on my knees, shining it under the bed. No monsters there, I announced, standing up. I walked to the closet door and flung it open as Ethan peeked out from behind my legs. No monsters here, either. Think you'll be all right now? He nodded and gave me a faint smile. I started to close the door when I noticed a strange gray hat in the corner. It was domed on top, with a circular rim and a red band around the base. A bowler hat. Weird. Why would that be there? As I straightened and started to turn around... Something moved out of the corner of my eye. I caught a glimpse of a figure hiding behind Ethan's bedroom door, its pale eyes watching me through the crack. I jerked my head around, but of course, there was nothing there. Jeez, now Ethan's got me seeing imaginary monsters. I need to stop watching those late-night horror flicks. A thunderous boom directly overhead made me jump, and fat drops plinked against the window panes. Rushing past Ethan, I burst out of the house and sprinted down the driveway. I was soaked when I reached the bus stop. The late spring rain wasn't frigid, but it was cold enough to be uncomfortable. I crossed my arms and huddled under a mossy cypress, waiting for the bus to arrive. Wonder where Robbie is, I mused, gazing down the road. He's usually here by now. Maybe he didn't feel like getting drenched and stayed home. I snorted and rolled my eyes. Skipping class again, huh? Slacker. Wish I could do that. If only I had a car. I knew kids whose parents gave them cars for their 16th birthday. Me? I'd be lucky if I got a cake. Most of my classmates already had licenses and could drive themselves to clubs and parties and anywhere they wanted. I was always left behind, the backward hick girl nobody wanted to invite. Except Robbie. I amended with a small mental shrug. At least Robbie will remember. Wonder what kooky thing he has planned for my birthday tomorrow. I could almost guarantee it would be something strange or crazy. Last year, he snuck me out of the house for a midnight picnic in the woods. It was weird. I remembered the glen and the little pond with the fireflies drifting over it. But though I explored the woods behind my house countless times since then... 
I never found it again. Something rustled in the bushes behind me, a possum or a deer or even a fox seeking shelter from the rain. The wildlife out here was stupidly bold and had little fear of humans. If it wasn't for Bo, Mom's vegetable garden would be a buffet for rabbits and deer, and the local raccoon family would help themselves to everything in our cupboards. A branch snapped in the trees, closer this time. I shifted uncomfortably, determined not to turn around for some stupid squirrel or raccoon. I'm not like inflatable Angie, Ms. Perfect Cheerleader, who'd flip out if she saw a caged gerbil or a speck of dirt on her Hollister jeans. I've pitched hay and killed rats and driven pigs through knee-deep mud. Wild animals don't scare me. Still, I stared down the road, hoping to see the bus turn the corner. Maybe it was the rain and my own sick imagination, but the woods felt like the set for the Blair Witch Project. There are no wolves or serial killers out here, I told myself. Stop being paranoid. The forest was suddenly very quiet. I leaned against the tree and shivered, trying to will the bus into appearing. A chill crawled up my back. I wasn't alone. Cautiously, I craned my neck up, peering through the leaves. An enormous black bird perched on a branch, feathers spiked out against the rain, sitting as motionless as a statue. As I watched, it turned its head and met my gaze, with eyes as green as colored glass. And then... Something reached around the tree and grabbed me. I screamed and leapt away, my heart hammering in my ears. Whirling around, I tensed to run, my mind filled with rapists and murderers and Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Laughter exploded behind me. Robbie Goodfelt, my closest neighbor, meaning he lived nearly two miles away, slouched against the tree trunk, gasping with mirth. Lanky and tall, in tattered jeans and an old T-shirt, he paused to look at my pale face before cracking up again. His spiky red hair lay plastered to his forehead, and his clothes clung to his skin, emphasizing his lean, bony frame, as though his limbs didn't fit quite right. Being drenched and covered in twigs, leaves, and mud didn't seem to bother him. Few things did. Damn it, Robbie! I raged, stomping up and aiming a kick at him. He dodged and staggered into the road, his face red from laughter. That wasn't funny, you idiot. You nearly gave me a heart attack. S sorry princess Robbie gasped, clutching his heart as he sucked in air. It was just too perfect. He gave a final chortle and straightened, holding his ribs. Man, that was impressive. You must have jumped three feet in the air. What did you think I was, Leatherface or something? Of course not, stupid. I turned away with a huff to hide my burning face. Then I told you to stop calling me that. I'm not ten anymore. Sure thing, princess. I rolled my eyes. Has anyone told you you have the maturity level of a four-year-old? He laughed cheerfully. <laughs> Look who's talking. I'm not the one who stayed up all night with the lights on after watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I tried to warn you. He made a grotesque face and staggered toward me, arms outstretched. Ooh, look out, it's Leatherface. I scowled and kicked water at him. He kicked some back, laughing. By the time the bus showed up a few minutes later, we were both covered in mud, dripping wet, and the bus driver told us to sit in the back. What are you doing after school? Robbie asked as we huddled in the far back seat. Around us, students talked, joked, laughed, and generally paid us no attention. Want to grab a coffee later? Or we could sneak into the theater and see a movie. Not today, Rob, I replied, trying to wring water from my shirt. Now that it was over, I dearly regretted our little mud battle. I was going to look like the creature from the Black Lagoon in front of Scott. You'll have to do your sneaking without me this time. I'm tutoring someone after class. Robbie's green eyes narrowed. Tutoring someone? Who? My stomach fluttered, and I tried not to grin. Scott Waldron? What? Robbie's lip curled in a grimace of disgust. The jockstrap? Why, does he need you to teach him how to read? I scowled at him. Just because he's captain of the football team doesn't mean you can be a jerk.
Or are you jealous? Oh, of course. That's it, Robbie said with a sneer. I've always wanted the IQ of a rock. No, wait, that wouldn't be an insult to the rock. He snorted. I can't believe you're going for the jockstrap. You can do so much better, princess. Don't call me that. I turned away to hide my burning face. And it's just a tutoring session. He's not going to ask me to the prom. Jeez. Right. Robbie sounded unconvinced. He's not. But you're hoping he will. Admit it. You're drooling over him just like every empty-headed cheerleader on campus. So what if I am? I snapped, spinning around. It's none of your business, Rob. What do you care, anyway? He got very quiet, muttering something unintelligible under his breath. I turned my back on him and stared out the window. I didn't care what Robbie said. This afternoon, for one glorious hour, Scott Waldron would be mine alone, and no one would distract me from that. School dragged. The teachers all spoke gibberish, and the clock seemed to be moving backward. The afternoon crept by in a daze. Finally, finally, the last bell rang, freeing me from the endless torture of X equals Y problems. Today is the day, I told myself as I maneuvered the crowded hallways, keeping to the edge of the teeming mass. Wet sneakers squeaked over tile, and a miasma of sweat, smoke, and body odor hung thick in the air. Nervousness fluttered inside me. You can do this. Don't think about it. Just go in and get it over with. Dodging students, I wove my way down the hall and peeked into the computer room. There he was, sitting at one of the desks with both feet up on another chair. Scott Waldron, captain of the football team. Gorgeous Scott. King of the school Scott. He wore a red and white letterman jacket that showed off his broad chest, and his thick, dark blonde hair brushed the top of his collar. My heart pounded. The whole hour in the same room with Scott Waldron, with no one to get in the way. Normally, I couldn't even get close to Scott. He was either surrounded by Angie and her cheerleader groupies, or his football buddies. There were other students in the computer lab with us, but they were nerds and academic types, beneath Scott Waldron's notice. The jocks and cheerleaders wouldn't be caught dead in here if they could help it. I took a deep breath and stepped into the room. He didn't glance at me when I walked up beside him. He lounged in the chair with his feet up and his head back, tossing an invisible ball across the room. I cleared my throat. Nothing. I cleared it a little louder. Still nothing. Gathering my courage, I stepped in front of him and waved. His coffee brown eyes finally jerked up to mine. For a moment, he looked startled. Then an eyebrow rose in a lazy arc, as if he couldn't figure out why I wanted to talk to him. Uh-oh. Say something, Meg. Something intelligent. Um... I stammered. Hi. I'm uh, Megan. I sit behind you in computer class. He was still giving me that blank stare, and I felt my cheeks getting hot. Uh, I really don't watch a lot of sports, but I think you're an awesome quarterback. Not that I've seen many. Well, just you, actually. But you really seem to know what you're doing. I go to all your games, you know? I'm usually in the very back, so you probably don't see me. Oh, God, shut up, Meg. Shut up now. I clamped my mouth closed to stop the incessant babbling, wanting to crawl into a hole and die. What was I thinking agreeing to this? Better to be invisible than to look like a complete and total moron, especially in front of Scott. He blinked lazily, reached up, and pulled the earphones from his ears. Sorry, babe. He drawled in that wonderful, deep voice of his. I couldn't hear you. He gave me a once-over and smirked. Are you supposed to be the tutor? Um, yes. I straightened and smoothed out my remaining shreds of dignity. I'm Megan. Mr. Sanders asked me to help you out with your programming project. He continued to smirk at me. Aren't you that hick girl who lives out in the swamp? Do you even know what a computer is? My face flamed and my stomach contracted into a tight little ball. Okay, so I didn't have a great computer at home. 
That was why I spent most of my after-school time here, in the lab, doing homework or just surfing online. In fact, I was hoping to make it into ITT tech in a couple of years. Programming and web design came easily to me. I knew how to work a computer, damn it. But in the face of Scott's criticism, I could only stammer. Yes, I do. I mean, I know a lot. He gave me a dubious look, and I felt the sting of wounded pride. I had to prove to him that I wasn't the backward hillbilly he thought I was. Here, I'll show you, I offered, and reached toward the keyboard on the table. Then something weird happened. I hadn't even touched the keys when the computer screen blipped on. When I paused, my fingers hovering over the board, words began to scroll across the blue screen. Megan Chase, we see you. We're coming for you. I froze. The words continued, those three sentences, over and over. Megan Chase, we see you. We're coming for you. Megan Chase, we see you. We're coming for you. Megan Chase, we see you. We're coming for you. Over and over until it completely filled the screen. Scott leaned back in his seat, glaring at me, then at the computer. What is this? He asked, scowling. What the hell are you doing, freak? Pushing him aside, I shook the mouse, punched escape, and pressed Control-Alt-Delete to stop the endless string of words. Nothing worked. Suddenly, without warning, the words stopped, and the screen went blank for a moment. Then, in giant letters, another message flashed into view. Scott Waldron peeks at guys in the shower room, R-O-F-L. I gasped. The message began to scroll across all the computer screens, wending its way around the room, with me powerless to stop it. The other students at the desks paused, shocked for a moment, then began to point and laugh. I could feel Scott's gaze like a knife in my back. Fearfully, I turned to find him glaring at me, chest heaving. His face was crimson, probably from rage or embarrassment, and he jabbed a finger in my direction. You think that's funny, Swamp Girl, do you? Just wait. I'll show you funny. You just dug your own grave, bitch. He stormed out of the room with the echo of laughter trailing behind him. A few of the students gave me grins, applause, and thumbs up. One of them even winked at me. My knees were shaking. I dropped into a chair and stared blankly at the computer screen, which suddenly flicked off, taking the offensive message with it but the damage was already done. My stomach roiled, and there was a stinging sensation behind my eyes. I buried my face in my hands. I'm dead. I'm so dead. That's it. Game over, Megan. I wonder if Mom will let me move to a boarding school in Canada. A faint snicker cut through my bleak thoughts, and I raised my head. Crouched atop the monitor, silhouetted black against the open window, was a tiny, misshapen thing. Spindly and emaciated, it had long, thin arms and huge bat-like ears. Slitted green eyes regarded me across the table, gleaming with intelligence. It grinned, showing off a mouthful of pointed teeth that glowed with neon blue light, before it vanished, like an image on the computer screen. I sat there a moment, staring at the spot where the creature had been, my mind spinning in a dozen directions at once. Okay? Great. Not only does Scott hate me, I'm starting to hallucinate as well. Megan Chase, victim of a nervous breakdown the day before she turned 16. Just send me off to the loony bin, because I sure won't survive another day at school. Dragging myself upright, I shuffled, zombie-like, into the hall. Robbie waited for me by the lockers, a soda bottle in each hand. Hey, princess, he greeted as I shambled past. You're out early. How the tutoring session go? Don't call me that, I muttered, banging my forehead into my locker. And the tutoring session went fabulous. Please kill me now. That good, huh? He tossed me a diet soda, which I barely caught, and twisted open his root beer in a hiss of foam. I could hear the grin in his voice. Well, I suppose I could say I told you so. I glared daggers at him, daring him to continue. The smile vanished from his face. But I won't. He pursed his lips, trying not to grin. Because that would just be wrong. What are you doing here, anyway? I demanded. The buses have all left by now. 
Were you lurking by the computer lab like some creepy stalker guy? Rob coughed loudly and took a long sip of his root beer. Hey, I was wondering, he continued brightly. What are you doing for your birthday tomorrow? Hiding in my room with the covers over my head, I thought, but shrugged and yanked open my rusty locker. I don't know, whatever. I don't have anything planned. I grabbed my books, stuffed them in my bag, and slammed the locker door. Why? Robbie gave me that smile that always makes me nervous, a grin that stretched his entire face so that his eyes narrowed to green slits. I've got a bottle of champagne I managed to swipe from the wine cabinet, he said in a low voice, waggling his eyebrows. How about I come by your place tomorrow? We can celebrate your birthday in style. I'd never had champagne. I did try a sip of Luke's beer once, and I thought I was going to throw up. Mom sometimes brought home wine in a box, and that wasn't terrible, but I wasn't much of an alcohol drinker. What the hell? You're only 16 once, right? Sure, I told Robbie and gave a resigned shrug. Sounds good. Might as well go out with a bang. He cocked his head at me. You okay, princess? What could I tell him? That the captain of the football team, who I'd been crushing on for two years, was out to get me? That I was seeing monsters at every turn? And that the school computers were either hacked or possessed? Yeah, right. I'd get no sympathy from the school's greatest prankster. Knowing Robbie, he'd think it was a brilliant joke and congratulate me. If I didn't know him better, I might even think he set it up. I just gave him a tired smile and nodded. I'm fine. I'll see you tomorrow, Robbie. See you then, princess. Mom was late picking me up again. The tutoring session was only supposed to be an hour, but I sat on the curb in the drizzling rain for another good half hour, contemplating my miserable life and watching cars pull in and out of the parking lot. Finally, her blue station wagon turned the corner and pulled to a stop in front of me. The front seat was filled with grocery bags and newspapers, so I slid into the back. Meg, you're sopping wet, cried my mother, watching me from the rearview mirror. Don't sit on the upholstery. Get a towel or something. Didn't you bring an umbrella? Nice to see you too, Mom, I thought, scowling as I grabbed a newspaper off the floor and put it on the seat. No, how was your day? Or, sorry I'm late. I should have abandoned the stupid tutoring session with Scott and taken the bus home. We drove in silence. People used to tell me I looked like her, that is, before Ethan came along and swallowed up the spotlight. To this day, I don't know where they saw the resemblance. Mom is one of those ladies who looks natural in a three-piece suit and heels. Me? I like baggy cargo pants and sneakers. Mom's hair hangs in thick golden ringlets. Mine is limp and fine, almost silver if it catches the light just right. She looks regal and graceful and slender. I just look skinny. Mom could have married anyone in the world, a movie star, a rich business tycoon, but she chose Luke the pig farmer and a shabby little farm out in the sticks, which reminded me. Hey, Mom, don't forget you have to take me to get a permit this weekend. Oh, Meg, Mom sighed. I don't know. I've got a lot of work this week, and your father wants me to help him fix the barn. Maybe next week. Mom, you promised. Megan, please. I've had a long day. Mom sighed again and looked back at me in the mirror. Her eyes were bloodshot and ringed with smeared mascara. I shifted uncomfortably. Had Mom been crying? What's up? I asked cautiously. She hesitated. There was an accident at home, she began, and her voice made my insides squirm. Your father had to take Ethan to the hospital this afternoon. She paused again, blinking rapidly, and took a short breath. Bo attacked him. What? My outburst made her start. Our German Shepherd attacking Ethan? Is Ethan all right? I demanded, feeling my stomach twist in fear. Yes. Mom gave me a tired smile. Very shaken up, but nothing serious, thank God. I breathed a sigh of relief. What happened? I asked, still unable to believe our dog actually attacked a family member. Bo adored Ethan, 
He got upset if anyone even scolded my half-brother. I'd seen Ethan yanking on Bo's fur, ears, and tail, and the dog barely responded with a lick. I'd seen Bo take Ethan's sleeve and gently tug him back from the driveway. Our German shepherd might be a terror to squirrels and deer, but he'd never even shown teeth to anyone in the house. Why did Bo go crazy like that? Mom shook her head. I don't know. Luke saw Bo run up the stairs, then heard Ethan screaming. When he got to his room, he found the dog dragging Ethan across the floor. His face was badly scratched, and there were bite marks on his arm. My blood ran cold. I saw Ethan being mauled, imagined his absolute terror when our previously trustworthy shepherd turned on him. It was so hard to believe, like something out of a horror movie. I knew Mom was just as stunned as I was. She'd trusted Bo completely. Still, Mom was holding back. I could tell by the way she pressed her lips together. There was something she wasn't telling me, and I was afraid I knew what it was. What will happen to Bo? Her eyes filled with tears, and my heart sank. We can't have a dangerous dog running around, Meg, she said, and I heard the plea for understanding. If Ethan asks, tell him that we found Bo another home. She took a deep breath and gripped the steering wheel tightly, not looking at me. It's for the safety of the family, Megan. Don't blame your father, but after Luke brought Ethan home, he took Bo to the pound. Chapter 2 Ringtone of Doom Dinner was tense that night. I was furious at both my parents, Luke for doing the deed and Mom for allowing him to do it. I refused to speak to either of them. Mom and Luke talked between themselves about useless, trivial stuff, and Ethan sat clutching Floppy in silence. It was weird not having Bo pacing around the table like he always did, looking for crumbs. I excused myself early and retreated to my room, slamming the door behind me. I flopped back on my bed, remembering all the times Bo had curled up here with me, a solid, warm presence. He never asked anyone for anything, content just to be near, making sure his charges were safe. Now he was gone, and the house seemed emptier for it. I wished I could talk to someone. I wanted to call Robbie and rant about the total unfairness of it all, but his parents, who were even more backward than mine, apparently, didn't have a phone or even a computer. Talk about living in the dark ages. Rob and I made our plans at school, or sometimes he would just show up outside my window, having walked the two miles to my house. It was a total pain in the ass, something I fully intended to fix once I got my own car. Mom and Luke couldn't keep me in this isolated bubble forever. Maybe my next big purchase would be cell phones for both of us, and screw what Luke thought about it. This whole technology is evil thing was getting really old. I'd talk to Robbie tomorrow. I couldn't do it tonight. Besides, the only phone in my house was the landline in the kitchen, and I didn't want to vent about grown-up stupidity with them in the same room. That wouldn't be pushing it. There was a timid knock on the door, and Ethan's head peeked inside. Hey, squirt. I sat up on the bed, swiping at a few stray tears. A dinosaur band-aid covered his forehead, and his right arm was wrapped in gauze. What's up? Mommy and Daddy sent Bo away. His lower lip trembled, and he hiccuped, wiping his eyes on Floppy's fur. I sighed and patted the bed. They had to. I explained as he clambered up and snuggled into my lap, rabbit and all. They didn't want Bo to bite you again. They were afraid you'd get hurt. Bo didn't bite me. Ethan gazed back at me with wide, teary eyes. I saw fear in them, and an understanding that went way beyond his years. Bo didn't hurt me, he insisted. Bo was trying to save me from the man in the closet. Monsters again? I sighed, wanting to dismiss it, but a part of me hesitated. What if Ethan was right? I've been seeing weird things too lately. What if... What if Bo really was protecting Ethan from something horrible and terrifying? 
No. I shook my head. This was ridiculous. I'd be turning sixteen in a few hours. That was way too old to believe in monsters. And it was high time Ethan grew up as well. He was a smart kid, and I was getting tired of him blaming imaginary boogeymen whenever something went wrong. Ethan, I sighed again, trying not to appear cranky. If I was too harsh, he'd probably start bawling, and I didn't want to upset him, after all he'd gone through today. Still, this had gone far enough. There are no monsters in your closet, Ethan. There's no such thing as monsters, okay? Yes, there are. He scowled and kicked his feet into the covers. I've seen them. They talk to me. They say the king wants to see me. He held out his arm, showing me the bandage. A man in the closet grabbed me here. He was pulling me under the bed when Bo came in and scared him off. Clearly, I wasn't going to change his mind, and I really didn't want a temper tantrum in my room right now. Okay, fine, I relented, wrapping my arms around him. Let's say something other than Bo grabbed you today. Why don't you tell Mom and Luke? They're grown-ups, Ethan said, as if it was perfectly clear. They won't believe me. They can't see the monsters. He sighed and looked at me with the gravest expression I'd ever seen on a kid. But Floppy says you can see them, if you try hard enough. You can see through the mist and the glamour. Floppy says so. The what and the what? Ethan? Mom's voice floated outside the door, and her silhouette appeared in the frame. Are you in here? Seeing us together, she blinked and offered a tentative smile. I glared back stonily. Mom ignored me. Ethan, honey, time to get ready for bed. It's been a long day. She held out her hand, and Ethan hopped down to pat across the room, dragging his rabbit behind him. Can I sleep with you and Daddy? I heard him ask, his voice small and scared. Oh, I guess so. Just for tonight, okay? Okay. Their voices faded away down the hall, and I kicked my door shut. That night, I had a strange dream about waking up and seeing Floppy, Ethan's stuffed rabbit, at the foot of my bed. In the dream, the rabbit was speaking to me, words that were grave and terrifying, filled with danger. It wanted to warn me, or it wanted me to help. I might have promised it something. The next morning, however, I couldn't remember much of the dream at all. I woke to the sound of rain drumming on the roof. My birthday seemed destined to be cold, ugly, and wet. For a moment, a heavy weight pressed at the back of my mind, though I didn't know why I felt so depressed. Then everything from the previous day came back to me, and I groaned. Happy birthday to me, I thought, burrowing under the covers. I'll be spending the rest of the week in bed, thanks. Megan? Mom's voice sounded outside my door, followed by a timid knock. It's getting late. Are you up yet? I ignored her and curled up farther into the covers. Resentment simmered as I thought of poor Bo, carted off to the pound. Mom knew I was mad at her, but she could stew in her guilt for a while. I wasn't ready to forgive and make up just yet. Megan, get up. You're going to miss the bus, said Mom, poking her head in the room. Her tone was matter-of-fact, and I snorted. So much for making up. I'm not going to school, I muttered from beneath the covers. I don't feel good. I think I've got the flu. Sick? On your birthday? That's unfortunate. Mom came into the room, and I peeked at her through a crack in the blankets. She remembered? Very sad, Mom continued, smiling at me and crossing her arms. I was going to take you to get a learner's permit after school today, but if you're sick... I popped up. Really? Um, well, I guess I don't feel all that bad. I'll just take some aspirin or something. I thought so. Mom shook her head as I bounced to my feet. I'm helping your father fix the barn this afternoon, so I can't pick you up. But as soon as you get home, we'll go to the license bureau together. That sound like a good birthday present? I barely heard her. I was too busy racing around the room, grabbing clothes and getting my stuff together. 
The sooner I got through the day, the better. I was stuffing homework into my backpack when the door creaked open again. Ethan peeked in the doorway, his hands behind his back, a shy, expectant smile on his face. I blinked at him and pushed back my hair. What do you need, squirt? With a grin, he stepped forward and held out a folded piece of paper. Bright crayon drawings decorated the front. A smiley-faced sun hovered over a little house with smoke curling from the chimney. Happy birthday, Maggie, he said, quite pleased with himself. See how I remembered? Smiling, I took the homemade card and opened it. Inside, a simple crayon drawing of our family smiled back. Stick figures of Mom and Luke, me and Ethan, holding hands, and a four-legged critter that had to be Bo. I felt a lump in my throat, and my eyes watered for just a moment. You like it? Ethan asked, watching me anxiously. I love it, I said, ruffling his hair. Thank you. Here, why don't you put it on the fridge so everyone can see what a great artist you are? He grinned and scampered off, clutching the card, and I felt my heart get a little bit lighter. Maybe today wouldn't be so terrible after all. So, your mom is taking you to get a permit today? Robbie asked as the bus pulled into the school parking lot. That's cool. You can finally drive us downtown into the movies. We won't have to depend on the bus or spend another evening watching VHS tapes on your 12-inch screen. It's only a permit, Rob. I gathered my backpack as the bus lurched to a halt. I won't have my license yet. Knowing Mom, it'll be another 16 years before I can drive the car on my own. Ethan will probably get a license before I do. The thought of my half-brother sent an unexpected chill through me. I remembered his words from the night before. You can see through the mist and the glamour. Floppy says so. Stuffed rabbit aside, I had no idea what he was talking about. As I walked down the bus steps, a familiar figure broke away from a large group and came striding toward me. Scott. My stomach twisted, and I gazed around for a suitable escape route, but before I could flee into the crowd, he was already in front of me. Hey. His voice, drawling and deep, made me shiver. Terrified as I was, he was still gorgeous, with his damp blonde hair falling in unruly waves and curls on his forehead. For some reason, he seemed nervous today, running his hands through his bangs and gazing around. Um... He hesitated, narrowing his eyes. What's your name again? Megan, I whispered. Oh, yeah. Stepping closer, he glanced back at his friends and lowered his voice. Listen, I feel bad about the way I treated you yesterday. It was uncalled for. I'm sorry. For a moment, I didn't understand what he was saying. I'd been expecting threats, taunts, or accusations. Then a great balloon of relief swelled inside me as his words finally registered. Uh, oh, I stammered, feeling my face heat. That's okay. Forget about it. I can't, he muttered. You've been on my mind since yesterday. I was a real jerk, and I'd like to make it up to you. Do... He stopped, chewing his lip then got it all out in a rush. Do you want to eat lunch with me this afternoon? My heart pounded. Butterflies swarmed madly in my stomach, and my feet felt like they were floating an inch off the ground. I barely had the voice to squeak a breathless, Sure. Scott grinned, showing blindingly white teeth, and gave me a wink. Hey guys, over here! One of Scott's football buddies stood a few feet away, a camera phone in hand, pointed at us. Smile for the birdie. Before I knew what was happening, Scott put a hand around my shoulder and pulled me close to his side. I blinked up at him, stunned, as my heart began racing around my chest. He flashed his dazzling grin at the camera, but I could only stare, stupefied like a moron. Thanks, Meg, Scott said, breaking away from me. See you at lunch. He smiled and trotted off toward the school with one final wink. The cameraman chuckled and sprinted after him, 
leaving me dazed and confused at the edge of the parking lot. For a moment, I stood there, staring like an idiot as my classmates surged around me. Then a grin spread across my face and I whooped, leaping into the air. Scott Waldron wanted to see me. He wanted to have lunch with me. Just me, in the cafeteria. Maybe my luck was finally turning around. My best birthday ever might just be starting. As a silvery curtain of rain crept over the parking lot, I felt eyes on me. Turning, I saw Robbie a few paces away, watching me through the crowd. Through the rain, his eyes glittered, a too bright green. As water pounded the concrete and students rushed toward the school, I saw a hint of something on his face. A long muzzle, slitted eyes, a tongue lolling out between pointed fangs. My stomach twisted, and I blinked, and Robbie was himself again. Normal, grinning, unconcerned that he was getting drenched. And so was I. With a little yelp, I sprinted beneath the overhang and ducked inside the school. Robbie followed, laughing, pulling at my limp strands of hair as I smacked him and he stopped. All through the first class, I kept glancing at Robbie, looking for that eerie, predatory hint on his face, wondering if I was crazy. All it got me was a sore neck and a brusque comment from my English teacher to pay attention and stop staring at boys. When the lunch bell rang, I leapt up, my heart fluttering a hundred miles a minute. Scott was waiting for me in the cafeteria. I grabbed my books, stuffed them into my backpack, whirled around, and came face to face with Robbie, standing behind me. I shrieked, Rob, I'm going to smack you if you don't stop doing that. Now move. I have to get somewhere. Don't go. His voice was quiet, serious. Surprised, I looked up at him. The perpetual goofy grin was gone, and his jaw was set. The look in his eyes was almost frightening. This is bad. I can feel it. Jockstrap is up to something. He and his buddies were hanging around the yearbook department for a long time after he talked to you. I don't like it. Promise me you won't go. I recoiled. Were you eavesdropping on us? I demanded, scowling. What's wrong with you? Ever hear of a private conversation? Waldron doesn't care about you. Robbie crossed his arms, daring me to contradict him. He'll break your heart, princess. Trust me. I've seen enough of his kind to know. Anger flared, anger that he dared stick his nose into my affairs, anger that he could be right. Again, it's none of your business, Rob, I snapped, making his eyebrows arch. And I can take care of myself, okay? Quit butting in where you're not wanted. Hurt glimmered briefly, but then it was gone. Fine, princess. He smirked, holding up his hands. Don't get your royal pink panties in a twist. Forget I said anything. I will. Tossing my head, I flounced out of the room without looking back. Guilt gnawed at me as I wove through the halls toward the cafeteria. I regretted snapping at Robbie, but sometimes his big brother act went too far. Still, Robbie had always been that way. Jealous, overprotective, forever looking out for me, like it was his job. I couldn't remember when I first met him. It felt like he'd always been there. The cafeteria was noisy and dim. I hovered just inside the door, looking for Scott, only to see him at a table in the middle of the floor, surrounded by cheerleaders and football jocks. I hesitated. I couldn't just march up to that table and sit down. Angie Whitmond and her cheerleading squad would rip me to shreds. Scott glanced up and saw me, and a lazy smile spread over his face. Taking that as an invitation, I started toward him weaving my way past the tables. He flipped out his iPhone, pressed a button, and looked at me with half-lidded eyes still grinning. A phone rang close by. I jumped a bit, but continued walking. Behind me, there were gasps, and then hysterical giggles. And then, the whispered conversation that always makes you think they're talking about you. I felt eyes on the back of my head. Trying to ignore it, I continued down the aisle. Another phone rang. And another. And now, 
Whispers and laughter were spreading like wildfire. For some reason, I felt horribly exposed, as if a spotlight shone right on me and I was on display. The laughter couldn't be directed at me, could it? I saw several people point in my direction, whispering among themselves, and tried my best to ignore them. Scott's table was only a few feet away. Hey, hot cheeks! A hand smacked my ass and I shrieked. Spinning around, I glared at Dan Ottoman, a blonde, pimply clarinet player from band. He leered back at me and winked. Never took you for a player, girl, he said, trying to ooze charm, but reminding me of a dirty Kermit the Frog. Come down to band sometime. I've got a flute you can play. What are you talking about? I snarled, but he snickered and held up his phone. At first, the screen was blank, but then a message flashed across it in bright yellow. How is Megan Chase like a cold beer? It read. I gasped, and the words disappeared as a picture flashed into view. Me. Me with Scott in the parking lot, his arm around my shoulders, a wide leer on his face. Only now, my mouth dropped open. I was but naked, staring at him in wonder, my eyes blank and stupid. He'd obviously used Photoshop. My body was obscenely skinny and featureless, like a doll's, my chest as flat as a twelve-year-old's. I froze, and my heart stopped beating as the second part of the message scrolled over the screen. She's smooth and goes down easy. The bottom dropped out of my stomach, and my cheeks flamed. Horrified, I looked up at Scott to see his whole table roaring with laughter and pointing at me. Ringtones echoed through the cafeteria, and laughter pounded me like physical waves. I started trembling, and my eyes burned. Covering my face, I turned and fled the cafeteria before I started wailing like a two-year-old. Shrieking laughter echoed around me, and tears stung my eyes like poison. I managed to cross the room without tripping over benches or my feet, bashed open the doors, and escaped into the hallway. I spent nearly an hour in the corner stall of the girls' bathroom, sobbing my eyes out and planning my move to Canada, or possibly Fiji, somewhere far, far away. I didn't dare show my face to anyone in this state ever again. Finally, as the tears slowed and my gasping breaths returned to normal— I reflected on how miserable my life had become. I guess I should feel honored, I thought bitterly, holding my breath as a group of girls flocked into the bathroom. Scott took the time to personally ruin my life. I bet he's never done that to anyone else. Lucky me, I'm the world's biggest loser. Tears threatened again, but I was tired of bawling and held them back. At first, I planned a hole up in the bathroom until school ended, but if anyone missed me from class, this would be the first place they'd look. So, I finally gathered the courage to tiptoe down to the nurse's office and fake a horrid stomach ache so I could hide out there. The nurse stood about four feet in thick-heeled loafers, but the look she gave me when I peered through the door suggested she wasn't going to take any teenage foolishness. Her skin looked like that of a shrunken walnut. Her white hair was pulled into a severe bun, and she wore tiny gold glasses on the end of her nose. Well now, Miss Chase, she said in a gravelly, high-pitched voice, setting aside her clipboard. What are you doing here? I blinked, wondering how she knew me. I'd only been to the nurse's office once before, when a stray soccer ball hit me in the nose. Back then, the nurse was bony and tall, with an overbite that made her look like a horse. This plump, shriveled little woman was new and slightly unnerving, with the way she stared at me. I have a stomach ache, I complained, holding my navel like it was about to burst. I just need to lie down for a few minutes. Of course, Miss Chase. There are some cots in the back. I'll bring you something to make you feel better. I nodded and moved into a room divided by several huge sheets. Except for myself and the nurse, the room was empty. Perfect. I chose a corner cot and lay back on the paper-covered mattress. Moments later, the nurse appeared, handing me a Dixie cup full of something that bubbled and steamed. Take this. You'll feel better, she said, 
pressing the cup into my hand. I stared at it. The fizzling white liquid smelled like chocolate and herbs, except stronger, somehow. A mix so potent it made my eyes water. What is it? I asked. The nurse just smiled and left the room. I took a cautious sip and felt warmth spread from my throat down to my stomach. The taste was incredible. Like the richest chocolate in the world, with just a hint of bitter aftertaste. I quaffed the rest in two gulps, holding the cup upside down to get the last drops. Almost immediately, I felt sleepy. Lying back on the crinkly mattress, I closed my eyes for just a moment, and everything faded away. I awoke to low voices, talking in furtive tones, just beyond the curtains. I tried to move, but it felt like my body was wrapped in cotton, my head filled with gauze. I struggled to keep my eyes open. On the other side of the sheets, I saw two silhouettes. Don't do anything reckless, warned a low, gravelly voice. The nurse, I thought, wondering in my delirium if she would give me more of that chocolatey stuff. Remember, your duty is to watch the girl. You must not do anything that will draw attention. Me? asked a tantalizing familiar voice. Draw attention to myself? Would I do such a thing? The nurse snorted. If the entire cheerleading squad turns into mice, Robin, I will be very upset with you. Mortal adolescents are blind and cruel, you know that. You mustn't take revenge, no matter how you feel about the girl. Especially now. There are more worrisome things on the move. I'm dreaming, I decided. That must be it. What was in that drink, anyway? In the dim light, the silhouettes playing across the curtain looked confusing and strange. The nurse, it seemed, was even smaller, barely three feet in height. The other shadow was even more peculiar. Normal size, but with strange protrusions on the side of his head that looked like horns. Or ears. The taller shadow sighed and moved to sit in a chair, crossing his long legs. I've heard the same, he muttered. Dark rumors are stirring. The courts are restless. Seems like something is out there that has both of them scared. Which is why you must continue to be both her shield and her guardian. The nurse turned, putting both hands on her hips, her voice chiding. I'm surprised you haven't given her the mist wine yet. She is sixteen today. The veil is beginning to lift. I know, I know, I'm getting to it. The shadow sighed, putting his head in his hands. I'll take care of that later this afternoon. How is she? Resting, said the nurse. Poor thing, she was traumatized. I gave her a mild sleep potion that will knock her out until she goes home. A chuckle. The last kid who drank one of your mild sleep potions didn't wake up for two weeks. You're one to talk about being inconspicuous. The nurse's reply was garbled and broken, but I was almost sure she said, She's her father's daughter. She'll be fine. Or maybe it was just me. The world went fuzzy, like an out-of-focus camera, and I knew nothing for a time. Megan! Someone was shaking me awake. I cursed and flailed, momentarily confused, and finally lifted my head. My eyes felt like they had ten pounds of sand in them and sleep gook crusted the corners, making it impossible to focus. Groaning, I wiped my lids and stared blearily into Robbie's face. For a moment, his brow was furrowed with concern. Then I blinked, and he was his normal, grinning self. Wakey, wakey, sleeping beauty, he teased as I struggled to a sitting position. Lucky you, school is out. It's time to go home. Huh? I muttered intelligently, wiping the last traces of sleep snot from my eyes. Robbie snorted and pulled me to my feet. Here, he said, handing me my backpack, heavy with books. You're lucky I'm such a great friend. I got notes for all the classes you missed after lunch. Oh, and you're forgiven, by the way. I won't even say, I told you so. He was speaking too fast. My brain was still asleep, my mind foggy and disconnected. What are you talking about? 
I mumbled, shrugging into my pack. And then I remembered. I need to call my mom, I said, dropping back on the cot. Robbie frowned and looked confused. She has to come pick me up, I elaborated. No way am I getting on the bus ever again. Despair settled on me, and I hid my face in my hands. Look, Megan, Robbie said. I heard what happened. It's not a big deal. Are you on crack? I asked, glaring at him through my fingers. The whole school is talking about me. This will probably go in the school paper. I'll be crucified if I show my face in public. And you say it's not a big deal? I drew my knees to my chest and buried my head in them. Everything was so horribly unfair. It's my birthday, I moaned into my jeans. This isn't supposed to happen to people on their birthdays. Robbie sighed. Dropping his bag, he sat down and put his arms around me, pulling me to his chest. I sniffled and shed a few tears into his jacket, listening to his heartbeat through his shirt. It thudded rapidly against his chest, like he'd been sprinting several miles. Come on. Robbie stood, pulling me up with him. You can do this. And I promise no one will care what happened today. By tomorrow, everyone will have forgotten about it. He smiled, squeezing my arm. Besides, don't you have a driver's permit to get? That one bright spark in the black misery of my life gave me hope. I nodded, stealing myself for what was to come. We left the nurse's office together, Robbie's hand clasped firmly around mine. Just stick close, he muttered as we neared the crowded part of the hallway. Angie and three of her groupies stood in front of the lockers, chattering away and snapping their gum. My stomach tensed and my heart began to pound. Robbie squeezed my hand. It's okay. Don't let go of me and don't say anything to anyone. They won't even notice we're here. As we neared the cluster of girls, I prepared for them to turn on me with their laughter and their ugly remarks. But we swept by them without so much as a glance though Angie was in the midst of describing my shameful retreat from the cafeteria. And then she, like, started bawling, Angie said, her nasal voice cutting through the hall. And I was like, oh my God, she's such a loser. But what can you expect from an inbred hillbilly? Her voice dropped to a whisper, and she leaned forward. I heard her mom has an unnatural obsession with pigs, if you know what I mean. The girls broke into a chorus of shocked giggles, and I almost snapped. Robbie, however, tightened his grip and pulled me away. I heard him mutter something under his breath and felt a shudder go through the air, like thunder with no sound. Behind us, Angie started to scream. I tried to turn back, but Robbie yanked me onward, weaving through the crowd as the rest of the students jerked their heads toward the shrieking. But for a split second... I saw Angie covering her nose with her hands, and her screams were sounding more and more like the squeals of a pig. Chapter 3 The Changeling The bus ride home was silent, at least between Robbie and me, partly because I didn't want to draw attention to myself, but mainly because I had a lot on my mind. We sat in the back corner, with me crushed against the window, staring at the trees flashing by. I had my iPod out and my headphones blasting my eardrums, but it was mostly an excuse not to talk to anyone. Angie's pig-like screams still echoed through my head. It was probably the most horrible sound I'd ever heard. And though she was a total bitch, I couldn't help but feel a little guilty. There was no doubt in my mind that Robbie had done something to her, though I couldn't prove it. I was actually afraid to bring it up. Robbie seemed like a different person now. Quiet. Brooding. Watching the kids on the bus with predator-like intensity. He was acting weird. Weird and creepy. And I wondered what was wrong with him. Then there was that strange dream, which I was beginning to think hadn't really been a dream at all. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that the familiar voice talking to the nurse had been Robbie's. Something was happening, something strange and creepy and terrifying. And the scariest part of all was that it wore a familiar, ordinary face. 
I snuck a glance at Robbie. How well did I know him? Really know him? He'd been my friend for longer than I could remember, and yet I'd never been to his house or met his parents. The few times I suggested meeting at his place, he'd always had some excuse not to. His folks were out of town, or they were remodeling the kitchen. A kitchen I'd never seen. That was strange, but what was weirder was the fact that I'd never wondered about it, never questioned it, until now. Robbie was simply there, like he'd been conjured out of nothing, with no background, no home, and no past. What was his favorite music? Did he have goals in life? Had he ever fallen in love? Not at all, my mind whispered disturbingly. You don't know him at all. I shivered and looked out the window again. The bus lurched to a halt at a four-way stop, and I saw we'd left the outskirts of town and were now heading into the boondocks, my neighborhood. Rain still spattered the windows, making the swampy marshlands blurry and indistinct, the trees fuzzy dark shapes through the glass. I blinked and straightened up in my seat. Deep in the swamp, a horse and rider stood beneath the limbs of an enormous oak, as still as the trees themselves. The horse was a huge black animal with a mane and a tail that rippled behind it, even drenched as it was. Its rider was tall and lean, garbed in silver and black. A dark cape fluttered from its shoulders. Through the rain, I caught the barest glimpse of a face. Young, pale, strikingly handsome, staring right at me. My stomach lurched and I caught my breath. Rob, I murmured, pulling my headphones out. Look at that. Robbie's face was inches from mine, staring out the window. His eyes narrowed to green slits, hard and dangerous. My stomach twisted and I leaned away from him, but he didn't notice me. His lips moved and he whispered one word, so soft I barely caught it, even as close as we were. Ash. Ash, I repeated, Who's Ash? The bus coughed and lurched forward again. Robbie leaned back, his face so still it could have been carved from stone. Swallowing, I looked out the window. But the space beneath the oak was empty. Horse and rider were gone, like they'd never existed. The weirdness kept getting weirder. Who's Ash? I repeated, turning back to Robbie, who seemed to be in his own world. Robbie? Hey! I poked him in the shoulder. He twitched and finally looked at me. Who is Ash? Ash? For a moment, his eyes were bright and feral, his face like that of a wild dog. Then he blinked and was normal again. Oh, he's just an old buddy of mine from long ago. Don't worry about it, princess. His words slid over me strangely, like he was willing me to forget simply by requesting it. I felt a prickle of annoyance that he was hiding something, but it quickly faded, because I couldn't remember what we were talking about. At our curb, Robbie leaped up as if the seat was on fire and rushed out the door. Blinking at his abrupt departure, I put my iPod safely in my backpack before leaving the bus. The last thing I wanted was for the expensive thing to get wet. I have to go, Robbie announced when I joined him on the pavement. His green eyes swept through the trees as if he expected something to come crashing out of the woods. I gazed around, but except for some bird trilling overhead, the forest was quiet and still. I, um, forgot something at home. He turned to me then with an apologetic look. See you tonight, princess? I'll bring that champagne over later, okay? Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Sure. Go straight home, okay? Robbie narrowed his eyes, his face intense. Don't stop, and don't talk to anyone you meet. Got it? I laughed nervously. <laughs> what are you, my mom? Are you going to tell me not to run with scissors and to look both ways before crossing the street? Besides, I continued as Robbie smirked, looking more like his normal self. Who would I meet way out here in the boondocks? The image of the boy on the horse suddenly came to mind and my stomach did that strange little flop again. Who was he? And why couldn't I stop thinking about him, if he even existed at all? Things were getting really odd, 
If it wasn't for Robbie's weird reaction on the bus, I would think the boy was another of my crazy hallucinations. Fine. Robbie waved, flashing his mischievous grin. See you later, princess. Don't let Leatherface catch you on your way home. I kicked at him. He laughed, bounced away, and sprinted off down the road. Shouldering my backpack, I trudged up the driveway. Mom? I called, opening the front door. Mom, I'm home. Silence greeted me, echoing off the walls and floor, hanging heavy in the air. The stillness was almost a living thing, crouched in the center of the room, watching me with cold eyes. My heart began a loud, irregular thud in my chest. Something was wrong. Mom? I called again, venturing into the house. Luke? Anybody home? The door creaked as I crept in further. The television blared and flickered, playing a rerun of an old black-and-white sitcom, though the couch in front of it was empty. I switched it off and continued down the hall into the kitchen. For a moment, everything looked normal, except for the refrigerator door, swinging on its hinges. A small object on the floor caught my attention. At first, I thought it was a dirty rag, but looking closer, I saw it was floppy. Ethan's rabbit. The stuffed animal's head had been torn off, and cotton spilled from the hole in the neck. Straightening, I heard a small noise on the other side of the dining table. I walked around, and my stomach twisted so violently that bile rose to my throat. My mother lay on her back on the checkered tile floor, arms and legs flung akimbo, one side of her face covered in glistening crimson. Her purse, its contents scattered everywhere, lay beside one limp white hand. Standing over her in the doorway, his head cocked to one side like a curious cat, was Ethan. And he was smiling. Mom! I screamed, flinging myself down beside her. Mom, are you okay? I grabbed one shoulder and shook her, but it was like shaking a dead fish. Her skin was still warm, though, so she couldn't be dead. Right? Where the hell is Luke? I shook her again, watching her head flop limply. It made my stomach turn. Mom, wake up. Can you hear me? It's Megan. I looked around frantically, then snatched a wash rag off the sink. As I dabbed it over her bloodied face, I became aware again of Ethan standing in the doorway, his blue eyes now wide and teary. Mommy slipped, he whispered, and I noticed a clear, slick puddle on the floor in front of the refrigerator. Hand trembling, I dipped a finger into the goo and sniffed. Vegetable oil? What the hell? I wiped more blood off her face and noticed a small gash on her temple, nearly invisible beneath blood and hair. Will she die? Ethan asked, and I glanced at him sharply. Though his eyes were huge and round, and tears brimmed in the corners, he sounded more curious than anything. I wrenched my gaze away from my half-brother. I had to get help. Luke was gone, so the only thing left would be to call for an ambulance. But just as I stood to get the phone, Mom groaned, stirred, and opened her eyes. My heart leapt. Mom, I said as she struggled into a sitting position, a dazed look on her face. Don't move. I'll call 911. Megan? Mom looked around, blinking. A hand came up to touch her cheek, and she stared at the blood on her fingers. What happened? Uh, I must have fallen. You hit your head, I replied, standing up and looking around for the phone. You might have a concussion. Hold on, I'm calling the ambulance. The ambulance? No. No. Mom sat up, looking a little clearer. Don't do that, honey, I'm fine. I'll just clean up and put on a band-aid. There's no need to go to that trouble. But Mom, I'm fine, Meg. Mom snatched the forgotten wash rag and began wiping the blood off her face. I'm sorry if I frightened you, but I'll be fine. It's only blood, nothing serious. Besides, we can't afford a big doctor's bill. She abruptly straightened and looked around the room. Where's your brother? Startled, I looked back to the doorway, but Ethan was gone.
Mom's protests were wasted when Luke got home. He took one look at her pale, bandaged face, threw a fit, and insisted they go to the hospital. Luke can be stubbornly persistent when he needs to be, and Mom eventually buckled under the pressure. She was still calling out instructions to me. Take care of Ethan, don't let him stay up too late, there's frozen pizza in the fridge, as Luke bundled her into his battered Ford and roared off down the driveway. As the truck turned a corner and vanished from sight, the chilly silence descended on the house once more. I shivered, rubbing my arms, feeling it creep into the room and breathe down my neck. The house where I'd lived most of my life seemed unfamiliar and frightening, as if things lurked in the cupboards and around corners, waiting to grab me as I walked past. My gaze lingered on the crumpled remains of Floppy, strewn across the floor, and for some reason, it made me very sad and scared. No one in this house would rip up Ethan's favorite stuffed animal. Something was very wrong. Footsteps padded over the floor. I turned to find Ethan in the doorway, staring at me. He looked strange without the rabbit in his arms, and I wondered why he wasn't upset about it. I'm hungry, he announced, making me blink. Cook me something, Maggie. I scowled at the demanding tone. It's not dinner time yet, Squirt, I told him, crossing my arms. You can wait a couple hours. His eyes narrowed and his lips curled back from his teeth. For just a moment, I imagined they were jagged and sharp. I'm hungry now, he growled, taking a step forward. Dread shot through me and I recoiled. Almost immediately, his face smoothed out again, his eyes enormous and pleading. Please, Maggie, he whined. Please, I'm so hungry. He pouted, and his voice turned menacing. Mommy didn't make me food either. All right, fine. If it'll shut you up, fine. The angry words erupted from fear and from a hot embarrassment because I was afraid. Of Ethan, of my stupid four-year-old half-brother, I didn't know where these demonic mood swings of his were coming from, but I hoped they weren't the start of a trend. Maybe he was just upset because of Mom's accident. Maybe if I fed the brat, he'd fall asleep and leave me alone for the night. I stalked to the freezer, grabbed the pizza, and shoved it in the oven. While the pizza cooked, I tried to clean up the puddle of vegetable oil in front of the refrigerator. I wondered how the stuff had ended up on the floor, especially when I found the empty bottle stuffed in the trash. I smelled like Crisco when I was done, and the floor still had a slick spot, but it was the best I could do. The creak of the oven door startled me. I turned to see Ethan pulling it open and reaching inside. Ethan? Grabbing his wrist, I yanked him back, ignoring his scream of protest. What are you doing, you idiot? You want to burn yourself? Hungry. Sit down, I snapped, plunking him into a dining chair. He actually tried to hit me, the little ingrate. I resisted the urge to smack him. God, you're being snotty today. Sit there and be quiet. I'll get your food in a second. When the pizza came out, he fell on it like a wild thing, not waiting for it to cool. Astonished, I could only stare as he tore through the slices like a starved dog, barely stopping to chew as he gulped it down. Soon, his face and hands were smeared with sauce and cheese, and the pizza was rapidly diminished. In less than two minutes, he had consumed it all, down to the last crumb. Ethan licked his hands, then raised his eyes to me and frowned. Still hungry. You are not, I told him, snapping out of my daze. If you eat anything else, you'll get sick. Go play in your room or something. He stared at me with a baleful expression, and it seemed that his skin grew darker, wrinkled, and shriveled beneath his baby fat. Without warning, he leaped off the chair, rushed me, and sank his teeth into my leg. Ow! Pain laced through my calf like an electrical shock. Grabbing his hair, I tried prying his teeth from my skin, but he clung to me like a leech and bit down harder. It felt like glass shards stabbing into my leg. Tears blurred my vision, and my knees almost buckled from the pain. Megan! 
Robbie stood inside the front door, a backpack flung over his shoulder, his green eyes wide with shock. Ethan released me, jerking his head toward the shout. Blood smeared his lips. Seeing Robbie, he hissed and, there's no other way to put it, scuttled away from us and up the stairs, vanishing from sight. I shook so hard I had to sit down on the couch. My leg throbbed, and my breath came in short, uneven gasps. Blood, bright and vivid, seeped through my jeans like an unfurling blossom. Dazed, I stared at it, numbness deadening my limbs, freezing them in shock. Robbie crossed the room in three strides and knelt beside me. Briskly, as if he'd done this kind of thing before, he began rolling up the cuff of one pant leg. Robbie? I whispered as he bent over his task, his long fingers surprisingly gentle. What's happening? Everything's going crazy. Ethan just attacked me, like a wild dog. That wasn't your brother, Robbie muttered as he pushed back the material, revealing a bloody mess below my knee. An oval of jagged puncture wounds marred my leg, seeping blood, and the skin around them was already purpling. Rob whistled softly. Nasty. Wait here. I'll be right back. Like I'm going anywhere, I replied automatically, and then his previous statement sunk in. Wait a minute. What do you mean that wasn't Ethan? Who the hell else could it be? Rob ignored me. Walking to his backpack, he opened it and pulled out a long, green-tinted bottle and a tiny crystal cup. I frowned. Why was he going for champagne now? I was hurt, in pain, and my kid brother had turned into a monster. I was certainly not in the mood for celebrating. With the utmost care, Robbie poured the champagne into the cup and walked back, being careful not to spill a single drop. Here, he said, giving it to me. The cup sparkled in his hand. Drink this. Where do you keep the towels? I took it suspiciously. In the bathroom. Just don't use Mom's good white ones. As Rob walked off, I peered into the tiny cup. There was barely enough for a swallow. It didn't look like champagne to me. I was expecting something fizzy, white, or pink, sparkling in the glass. The liquid in the cup was a deep, dark red, the color of blood. A fine mist writhed and danced on the surface. What is this? Robbie, returning from the bathroom with a white towel, rolled his eyes. Do you have to question everything? It will help you forget the pain. Just drink it already. I sniffed experimentally, expecting hints of roses or berries or some type of sweet scent mixed in with the alcohol. It smelled of nothing. Nothing at all. Oh well, I raised the glass in a silent toast. Happy birthday to me. The wine filled my mouth, flooding my senses. It tasted of nothing and everything. It tasted of twilight and mist, moonlight and frost, emptiness and longing. The room swayed, and I fell back against the couch. It was so strong. Reality blurred at the edges, wrapping me in a fuzzy haze. I felt sick and sleepy all at once. By the time my senses cleared, Robbie was tying a bandage around my leg. I didn't remember him cleaning or dressing the wound. I felt numb and dazed, like a blanket had dropped over my thoughts, making it hard to concentrate. There, Robbie said, straightening up. That's done. At least your leg won't fall off. His eyes swept up to mine, anxious and assessing. How are you feeling, Princess? Un... I said intelligently and tried to sweep the cobwebs from my brain. There was something I wasn't remembering, something important. Why was Robbie binding my leg? Had I hurt myself somehow? I bolted upright. Ethan bit me! I exclaimed, indignant and furious all over again. I turned on Robbie. And you! You said that wasn't Ethan at all. What were you talking about? What's going on? Relax, princess. Robbie tossed the bloody towel onto the floor and plopped onto a footstool. He sighed. I was hoping it wouldn't come to this. My fault, I suppose. I shouldn't have left you alone today. 
What are you talking about? You weren't supposed to see this. Any of this. Robbie went on, to my utter confusion. He seemed to be talking more to himself than me. Your sight has always been strong. That was a given. Still, I didn't expect them to go after your family, too. This changes things. Rob, if you don't tell me what's going on... Robbie looked at me. His eyes gleamed, impish and feral. Tell you? Are you sure? His voice went soft and dangerous, and goosebumps crawled up my arms. Once you start seeing things, you won't be able to stop. People have gone mad with too much knowledge. He sighed, and the menace dropped from his eyes. I don't want that to happen to you, princess. It doesn't have to be this way, you know. I can make you forget all of this. Forget? He nodded and held up the wine bottle. This is mist wine. You just had a swallow. A cup will make everything go back to normal. He balanced the bottle on two fingers, watching it sway back and forth. One cup and you'll be normal again. Your brother's behavior will not seem strange, and you won't remember anything weird or scary. You know what they say. Ignorance is bliss, right? Despite my uneasiness, I felt a slow flame of anger burning my chest. So, you want me to drink that... that stuff and just forget about Ethan? Just forget about my only brother. That's what you're saying. He raised an eyebrow. Well, when you put it like that... The burning grew hot and furious, searing away the fear. I clenched my fists. Of course I won't forget about Ethan. He's my brother. Are you really that inhuman or just stupid? To my surprise, a grin spread over his face. He dropped the bottle, caught it, and put it on the floor. The first, he said, very softly. That threw me. What? Inhuman. He was still grinning at me the smile stretching his whole mouth so that his teeth gleamed in the fading light. I warned you, princess. I'm not like you. And now, neither is your brother. Despite the fear prickling my stomach, I leaned forward. Ethan? What do you mean? What's wrong with him? That wasn't Ethan. Robbie leaned back, crossing his arms, the thing that attacked you today is a changeling. Chapter 4 Puck I stared at Robbie, wondering if this was another one of his stupid pranks. He sat there, observing me calmly, watching my reaction. Though he still wore a half-grin, his eyes were hard and serious. He wasn't joking around. Ch changeling I finally stammered, looking at him like he was insane. Is that some kind of... of... fairy? Robbie finished for me. A changeling is a fairy offspring that has been switched with a human child, usually a trolls or goblins, though the she, the fairy nobility, have been known to make the switch as well. Your brother has been replaced. That thing is not Ethan, any more than I am. You're crazy, I whispered. If I wasn't sitting, I'd be backing away from him toward the door. You've gone off the deep end. Time to cut back on the anime, Rob. There's no such thing as fairies. Robbie sighed. Really? That's what you're going with? How predictable. He leaned back and crossed his arms. I thought better of you, princess. Thought better of me? I cried, leaping off the couch. Listen to yourself. You really expect me to believe that my brother is some kind of pixie with glitter dust and butterfly wings? Don't be stupid, Rob said mildly. You have no idea what you're talking about. You're thinking Tinkerbell, which is a typical human response to the word fairy. The real fae aren't like that at all. He paused a moment. Well, except for the piskies, of course. But that's a different story altogether. 
I shook my head, my thoughts spinning in several directions at once. I can't deal with this right now, I muttered and staggered away from him. I have to check on Ethan. Robbie only shrugged, leaned back against the wall, and put his hands behind his head. After one final glare at him, I rushed up the stairs and opened the door to Ethan's bedroom. It was a mess, a war zone of broken toys, books, and scattered clothes. I looked around for Ethan, but the room appeared empty, until I heard a faint scratching noise under his bed. Ethan? Kneeling down, pushing away broken action figures and snapped tinker toys, I peered into the space between the mattress and the floor. In the shadows, I could just make out a small lump huddled in the corner with his back to me. He was trembling. Ethan? I called softly. Are you all right? Why don't you come out a second? I'm not mad at you. Well, that was a lie, but I was more shaken than angry. I wanted to drag Ethan downstairs and prove that he wasn't a troll or a changeling or whatever Robbie said he was. The lump stirred a little, and Ethan's voice drifted out of the gap. Is the scary man still here? He asked in a small, frightened voice. I might have been sympathetic if my calf wasn't throbbing so much. No, I lied. He's gone now. You can come out. Ethan didn't move, and my irritation sparked. Ethan, this is ridiculous. Get out of there already, will you? I stuck my head farther under the mattress and reached for him. Ethan turned on me with a hiss, eyes burning yellow, and lunged at my arm. I jerked it back as his teeth, jaggedly pointed like a shark's, snapped together with a horrid clicking sound. Ethan snarled, his skin the ghastly blue of a drowned infant's, bared teeth shining in the darkness. I shrieked, scrabbling back, Lego blocks and tinker toys biting into my palms. Hitting the wall, I leaped to my feet, turned, and fled the room. I ran smack into Robbie, standing outside the door. He grabbed my shoulders as I screamed and started hitting him, barely conscious of what I was doing. He bore the attack wordlessly, simply holding me in place, until I collapsed against him and buried my head in his chest. And he held me as I sobbed out my fear and anger. At last, the tears stopped, leaving me drained and utterly exhausted. I sniffed and backed away, wiping my eyes on my palm, shaking. Robbie still stood there quietly, his shirt damp with my tears. The door to Ethan's bedroom was shut, but I could hear faint thumps and cackling laughter beyond the door. I shivered, looking up at Robbie. Ethan is really gone? I whispered. He's not just hiding somewhere? He's really gone? Robbie nodded gravely. I looked at Ethan's bedroom door and bit my lip. Where is he now? Probably in Fairyland. Stated so simply, I almost laughed from the sheer ridiculousness of it all. Ethan had been stolen by fairies and replaced with an evil doppelganger. Fairies kidnapped my brother. I was tempted to pinch myself to see if this was a twisted dream or hallucination. Maybe I had fallen into a drunken stupor on the couch. On impulse, I bit the inside of my cheek, hard, the sharp pain and taste of blood told me this was, indeed, real. I looked to Robbie, and his grave expression banished the last of my doubts. A sick feeling rose to my stomach, making me nauseous and afraid. So... I swallowed and forced myself to be calm. Okay, Ethan was kidnapped by fairies. I could deal with this. What do we do now? Robbie raised one shoulder. That's up to you, princess. There are human families that have raised changelings as their own, though they are usually unaware of the child's true nature. Generally speaking, if you feed it and leave it alone, it will settle into its new home without too much trouble. Changelings make a nuisance of themselves at first, but most families adapt. Robbie grinned, but it was an attempt at lightheartedness rather than humor. Hopefully, 
Your folks will think he's just going through a late terrible twos. Robbie, that thing bit me and probably made Mom slip and fall in the kitchen. It's more than a nuisance. It's dangerous. I glared at Ethan's closed door and shuddered. I want it gone. I want my brother back. How do we get rid of it? Robbie sobered. Well, there are ways of getting rid of changelings. He began, looking uncomfortable. One old method is to brew beer or cook stew in eggshells, and that will make the changeling comment on the weirdness of it. But that method was for infants who'd been switched. Since the baby was too young to speak, the parents knew that the imposter was a changeling, and the real parents had to take it back. I don't think it'll work for someone older, like your brother. Great. What's another way? Er, uh, the other way is to beat the changeling near to death until the screams force the fey parents to return the real child. Barring that, you could stick him in the oven and cook him alive. Stop. I felt sick. I can't do any of those things, Robbie. I just can't. There has to be another way. Well... Rob looked hesitant and scratched the back of his neck. The only other way is to travel into the fairy lands and take him back. Bringing the real child into the home again will force the changeling to leave. But... He paused as if on the verge of saying something, only to think better of it. But what? But... You don't know who took your brother. And without that knowledge, you'll just be walking in circles. And if you're wondering, walking in circles in Fairyland is a very, very bad idea. I narrowed my eyes. I don't know who took him. I agreed, staring hard at Robbie. But you do. Robbie shuffled nervously. I have a guess. Who? It's just a guess, mind you. I could be wrong. Don't go jumping to conclusions. Robbie! He sighed. The Unseelie Court. The what? The Unseelie Court, Robbie repeated. The Court of Mab, Queen of Air and Darkness, sworn enemies of King Oberon and Queen Titania. Very powerful. Very nasty. Wait, wait, wait. I held up my hands. Oberon? Titania? Like, from a Midsummer Night's Dream? Aren't those just ancient myths? Ancient, yes, Robbie said. Myths, no. The fairy lords are immortal. Those who have songs, ballads, and stories written about them never die. Belief, worship, imagination. We were born of the dreams and fears of mortals. And if we are remembered, even in some small way, we will always exist. You keep saying we... I pointed out, as though you're one of those immortal fairies, as though you're one of them. Robbie smiled, a proud, impish smile, and I gulped. Who are you, anyway? Ah, well. Robbie shrugged, trying to look modest and failing entirely. If you've read A Midsummer Night's Dream, you might remember me. There was this unfortunate incident, completely unplanned, where I gave someone a donkey's head and made Titania fall in love with him. I ran through the play in my mind. I'd read it in the seventh grade, but had forgotten most of the plot. There were so many characters, so many names to sift through, people falling in and out of love so often it was ridiculous. I remembered a few human names, Hermia, Helena, Demetrius... On the fairy side, there was Oberon and Titania and... Shit, I whispered, falling back against the wall. I stared at Robbie with new eyes. Robbie Goodfell. Robin. You're Robin Goodfellow. Robbie grinned. Call me Puck. Puck. The Puck was standing in my hallway. No way, I whispered, shaking my head. This was Robbie, my closest friend. I would have known if he was an ancient fairy. Wouldn't I? 
Frighteningly, the more I thought about it, the more likely it seemed. I'd never seen Robbie's house or his parents. The teachers all loved him, though he never did a lick of schoolwork and slept through most of the classes. And strange things happened when he was around. Mice and frogs ended up in desks, or names were switched around on term papers. Though Robbie Goodfell thought these scenarios absolutely hilarious, no one ever suspected him. No, I muttered again, backing away toward my room. That's impossible. Puck is a legend, a myth. I don't believe it. Robbie gave me that eerie smile. Then, Princess, by all means, let me assure you. His arms rose from his sides as if he might levitate into the air. From downstairs, I heard the front door creak open, and I hoped Mom and Luke weren't home yet. Yeah, Mom, Ethan's turned into a monster, and my best friend thinks he's a fairy. How was your day? An enormous black bird swooped into the hallway. I yelped and ducked as the raven or crow or whatever it was made a beeline straight for Robbie and perched on his arm. They watched me, the pair of them, with glittering eyes, and Robbie smiled. A rush of wind, and suddenly the air was filled with screaming black birds swooping in from the open door. I gasped and ducked as the cloud of ravens filled the hallway, their raucous cries nearly deafening me. They swirled around Robbie, a tornado of beating wings and sharp claws, tearing at him with talons and beaks. Feathers flew everywhere, and Robbie disappeared within the swirling mass. Then, as one, the birds scattered, flying out the open door as swiftly as they had come. As the last bird swooped outside, the door slammed behind it, and silence descended once more. I caught my breath and glanced at Rob. Robbie was gone. Only a swirl of black feathers and dust motes remained in the place where he'd stood. It was too much. I felt my sanity unravel like frayed cloth. With a choked scream, I turned and fled into my room, slamming the door behind me. Flinging myself under my bed covers, I put the pillow over my head and shook, hoping that when I woke up, things would be normal. My door opened, and the sound of wings fluttered into my room. I didn't want to look, and I pulled the covers tighter around me, willing the nightmare to end. I heard a sigh, and footsteps padded over the floor. Well, I tried to warn you, princess. I peeked out. Robbie stood there, looking down at me, a pained smile on his face. Seeing him, I felt relieved, angry, and terrified at the same time. I threw off the covers and sat up, narrowing my eyes as I stared at him. Robbie waited, hands in the pockets of his jeans, as if daring me to contradict him some more. You really are Puck? I said finally. The Puck? Like in the stories? Robbie, slash Puck, gave a little bow. The one and only. My heart was still pounding. I took a deep breath to calm it and glared at the stranger in my room. My emotions churned. I didn't know what to feel. I settled on anger. Robbie had been my best friend for years, and he never saw fit to share his secret with me. You could have told me sooner, I said, trying not to sound hurt. I would have kept your secret. He only smirked and raised an eyebrow, infuriating me even more. Fine. Go back to Fairyland or wherever you come from. Aren't you supposed to be Oberon's jester or something? Why were you hanging around me so long? You wound me, princess. Robbie sounded anything but hurt. And after I made up my mind to help you get your brother back. My anger vanished instantly, replaced with fear. With all the talk of fae and fairy lords, I'd nearly forgotten about Ethan. I shivered as my stomach twisted into a tight little ball. This still felt like something out of a nightmare. But Ethan was gone, and fairies were real. I had to accept that now. Robbie stood there, gazing at me expectantly. A black feather dropped from his hair, spiraling down to the bed. Gingerly, I picked it up, twirling it in my fingers. 
It felt solid and real. You'll help me? I whispered. He gave me a shrewd look, one corner of his mouth turning up. Do you know the way into fairy by yourself? No. Then you need my help. Robbie smiled and rubbed his hands together. Besides, it's been a while since I've gone home, and nothing ever happens here. Storming the unseelie court sounds like fun. I didn't share his enthusiasm. When do we leave? I asked. Now, Robbie replied. The sooner the better. Do you have anything you want to take, princess? You might not be back for a while. I nodded, trying to stay calm. Just give me a minute. Robbie nodded and walked into the hallway. I snatched my bright orange backpack and tossed it on the bed, wondering what to take. What did one need for an overnight trip to fairyland? I grabbed jeans and an extra shirt, a flashlight, and a bottle of aspirin, stuffing them into the pack. Walking down to the kitchen, I tossed in a Coke and a couple of bags of chips, hoping Robbie would know where to find food on the journey. Finally, not even knowing why, I grabbed my iPod zipping it into the side pocket. Mom was supposed to take me to the DMV today. I hesitated, biting my lip. What would Mom and Luke think when they found me gone? I'd always followed the rules, never sneaking out, except that one time with Robbie, never staying up past curfew. I wondered what Rob meant when he'd said we'd be gone a while. Luke might not even notice I'd left, but Mom would worry. Grabbing an old homework sheet, I started to write her a quick note, but stopped, my pen hovering over the paper. What are you going to tell her? Dear Mom, Ethan's been kidnapped by fairies. Gone to get him back. Oh, and don't trust the Ethan that's here. He's really a fairy changeling. It sounded insane even to me. I hesitated, thinking, then scrawled a quick, Mom, there's something I have to take care of. I'll be back soon, I promise. Don't worry about me, Megan. I stuck the note on the refrigerator door, trying not to think that I might never see home again. Shouldering the pack, feeling my insides squirm like a nest of snakes, I climbed the stairs. Robbie waited on the landing, arms crossed over his chest, wearing a lazy grin. Ready? Apprehension tickled my stomach. Will it be very dangerous? How oh, extremely, Robbie said, walking up to Ethan's bedroom door. That's what makes it fun. You can die in so many interesting ways. Skewered on a glass sword, dragged underwater and eaten by a kelpie, turned into a spider or a rosebush for all time. He looked back at me. Well, are you coming or not? I noticed my hands were shaking and held them to my chest. Why are you saying these things? I whispered. Are you trying to scare me? Yes, Robbie replied unabashed. He paused at Ethan's door, one hand on the knob, and stared at me. These are the things you're going to face, princess. I'm giving you fair warning now. Still think you want to go? My previous offer still stands. I remembered the taste of the mist wine, the desperate longing for more, and shivered. No, I said quickly. I won't leave Ethan with a bunch of monsters. I've lost a father already. I won't lose a brother as well. And then something occurred to me, something that left me breathless, wondering why I didn't think of it before. Dad. My heart pounded, recalling half-remembered dreams where my father vanished beneath a pond and never resurfaced. What if he'd been kidnapped by fairies as well? I could find Ethan and my dad and bring them both home. Let's go, I demanded, looking Robbie in the eyes. Come on, we've wasted enough time here. If we're going to do this, let's get it over with. Rob blinked, and a strange look passed over his face. For a moment, it seemed like he wanted to say something. But then he shook himself, like he was coming out of a trance, and the moment was gone. All right, then. Don't say I didn't warn you. He grinned, and the gleam in his eyes grew brighter. First things first, we have to find an entrance to the Never Never. That's fairyland to you. It's not a place you can just walk to, and the doors are usually very well hidden. Fortunately, I have a good idea where one is lurking. 
He grinned, turned away, and pounded on Ethan's bedroom door. Knock, knock, he called in a high sing-song voice. For a moment, silence. Then came a thud and a crash, as if something heavy had been hurled at the door. Go away, snarled the voice from within. Uh, no, that's not how the joke goes, called Rob. I say knock, knock, and you're supposed to answer with, who's there? Fuck off. Nope, that's still wrong. Robbie seemed unperturbed. I, however, was horrified at Ethan's language, though I knew it wasn't him. Here, continued Rob in an amiable voice. I'll go through the whole thing so you'll know how to answer next time. He cleared his throat and pounded the door again. Knock, knock, he bellowed. Who's there? Puck. Puck who? Puck, who will turn you into a squealing pig and stuff you in the oven if you don't get out of our way. And with that, he banged open the door. The thing that looked like Ethan stood on the bed, a book in each hand. With a hiss, he hurled them at the doorway. Robbie dodged, but one paperback hit me in the stomach, and I grunted. Please, I heard Rob mutter, and a ripple went through the air. Suddenly, all the books in the room flapped their covers, rose off the floor and shelves, and began dive-bombing Ethan like a flock of enraged seagulls. I could only stare, feeling my life get more surreal by the second. The fake Ethan hissed and snarled, swatting at the books as they buzzed around him, until one hit him smack in the face and tumbled him off the mattress. Spitting in fury, he darted under the bed, I heard claws scrabbling against the wood as his feet vanished into the crawlspace. Curses and growls drifted out from the darkness. Robbie shook his head. Amateurs. He sighed as the books swooping around the room froze mid-flight and rained to the floor with echoing thuds. Let's go, princess. I shook myself and picked my way over fallen books, joining Robbie in the middle of the room. So... I ventured, trying to sound casual, as if flying books and fairies were something I encountered every day. Where's the entrance to fairyland? Will you have to make a magic ring or cast a spell or something? Rob snickered. Not exactly, princess. You're making it too complicated. Doorways to the never-never tend to appear in places where there is a lot of belief, creativity, or imagination. Often you can find one in a child's bedroom closet or under his bed. Floppy's afraid of the man in the closet. I shivered, mentally apologizing to my half-brother. When I found him again, I'd be sure to tell him I believed in the monsters, too. The closet, then, I murmured, stepping over books and toys to reach it. My hand shook a bit as I grabbed the doorknob. No turning back now, I told myself, and pulled it open. A tall, emaciated figure with a narrow face and sunken eyes stared at me as the door swung open. A black suit clung to its rail-thin body, and a bowler hat perched atop its pointed head. It blinked wide, staring at me, and bloodless lips pulled back in a grimace, revealing thin, pointed teeth. I leaped back with a shriek. My closet, hissed the figure, a spider-like hand darted out and grabbed the doorknob. My closet, mine. And it slammed the door with a bang. Robbie gave an exasperated sigh as I skittered behind him, my heart careening around my ribcage like a bat. Bogies, he muttered, shaking his head. He strode to the door, tapped on it three times, and flung it open. This time, the space stood empty, except for hanging shirts, stacked boxes, and normal closet things. Robbie shoved aside the clothes, maneuvered around the boxes, and put a hand to the back wall, tracing his fingers along the wood. Curious, I edged closer. Where are you? He muttered, feeling along the wall. I crept to the doorway and peered over his shoulder. I know you're here. Where is aha crouching down he took a breath and blew against the wall instantly a cloud of dust rose billowing around him and sparkling like orange glitter when he straightened i saw a gold handle on the back wall and the faint outline of a door 
pale light shining through the bottom crack. Come on, princess. Rob turned and beckoned me forward. His eyes glowed green in the darkness. This is our ride. Your one-way ticket to the never-never. I hesitated, waiting for my pulse to slow to something resembling normal. It didn't. This is insane, a small, scared part of me whispered. Who knew what waited through that doorway, what horrors lurked in the shadows? I might never come home again. This was my last chance to turn back. No, I told myself. I can't turn back. Ethan is out there, somewhere. Ethan is counting on me. I took a deep breath and one step forward. A wrinkled hand shot from beneath the bed, latching onto my ankle. It yanked savagely and I nearly fell as a snarl echoed from the dark space beneath. With a shriek, I kicked free the flailing claw, charged blindly into the closet, and slammed the door behind me. Chapter 5 The Never Never In the musty darkness of Ethan's closet, I pressed a hand to my chest and waited once more for my heartbeat to return to normal. Blackness surrounded me, except for the thin rectangle of light outlined against the far wall. I couldn't see Robbie, but I felt his presence close by, heard his quiet breathing in my ear. Ready? He whispered, his breath warm on my skin. And before I could answer, he pushed the door back with a creak, revealing the never-never. Pale silver light flooded the room. The clearing beyond the doorframe was surrounded by enormous trees, so thick and tangled I couldn't see the sky through the branches. A curling mist crept along the ground, and the woods were dark and still, as if the forest was trapped in perpetual twilight. Here and there, brilliant splashes of color stood out among the gray. A patch of flowers, their petals a shocking electric blue, waved gently in the mist. A creeper vine snaked around the trunk of a dying oak, long red thorns a stark contrast to the tree it was killing. A warm breeze blew into the closet, carrying with it a shocking assortment of smells, smells that should not be together in one place, crushed leaves and cinnamon, smoke and apples, fresh earth, lavender, and the faint, cloying scent of rot and decay. For a moment, I caught a tang of something metallic and coppery, wrapped around the smell of rot, but it was gone in the next breath. Clouds of insects swarmed overhead, and if I listened hard, I could almost imagine I heard singing. The forest was still at first, but then I caught movement deep in the shadows and heard leaves rustle all around us. Invisible eyes seemed to watch me from every angle, boring into my skin. Robbie, his hair a bright flame atop his head, stepped through the doorway, gazed around, and laughed. Home, he sighed, flinging his arms wide as if to embrace it all. I'm finally home. He spun in place and with another laugh fell backward into the mist like he was making a snow angel and vanished. I gulped and took a cautious step forward. Mist swirled around my ankles like a living thing, caressing my skin with damp fingers. Rob? The silence mocked me. Out of the corner of my eye, something big and white darted into the trees like quicksilver. Rob? I called again, edging to the place he had fallen. Where are you? Robbie? Boo. Rob appeared behind me, rising out of the mist like a vampire from its coffin. To say I screamed was a bit of an understatement. A little jumpy today, aren't we? Robbie laughed and darted out of reach before I could kill him. Time to switch to decaf, princess. If you're going to shriek at every bogey that jumps out and says boo, you'll be exhausted before we reach the edge of the woods. He had changed. Hunter green pants and a thick brown hoodie replaced his jeans and ratty t-shirt. I couldn't see his feet very well in the mist, but it looked like he'd traded his sneakers for soft leather boots. His face was leaner, harsher, with sharp angles and pointed features. Combined with his bright auburn hair and green eyes, 
he reminded me of a grinning fox. But the most noticeable difference was his ears. Slender and pointed, they jutted out from the sides of his head, like, well, like an elf's. And in that moment, all traces of Robbie Goodfell disappeared. The boy I'd known for most of my life was gone, like he never existed, and only Puck remained. What's the matter, princess? Puck yawned, stretching his long limbs. Was it my imagination, or had he gotten taller, too? You look like you lost your best friend. I ignored the question, not wanting to dwell on it. How did you do that? I asked to steer the conversation elsewhere. Your clothes, I mean. They're different. And the way you made the books fly around the room. Was it magic? Puck grinned. Glamour, he said, as if that meant anything to me at all. I frowned at him, and he sighed. I didn't have time to change before we came here, and my Lord King Oberon frowns on wearing mortal clothes to court. So I used glamour to make myself presentable, just like I used glamour to make myself look human. Wait a minute. I thought back to the dream conversation between Robbie and the nurse. Are there others like you, you fairy types walking around back home, right under everyone's noses? Puck gave me a very eerie smile. We're everywhere, princess, he said firmly. Under your bed, in your attic, walking past you on the street. His smile grew wider, more wolfish. Glamour is fueled by the dreams and imagination of mortals. Writers, artists, little boys pretending to be knights. The fae are drawn to them like moths to a flame. Why do you think so many children have imaginary friends? Even your brother had one. Floppy, I think he called it, though that wasn't its true name. A pity the changeling managed to kill it. My stomach felt tight. And no one can see you? We're invisible, or we use glamour to hide our true nature. Puck leaned against a tree, lacing his hands behind his head in a very Robbie-like fashion. Don't look so shocked, princess. Mortals have perfected the art of not seeing what they don't expect to be there. Though, there are a few rare humans who can see through the mist and the glamour. Usually, they are very special individuals. Innocent, naive dreamers. And the Fae are even more attracted to them. Like Ethan, I murmured. Puck gave me a strange look, one corner of his mouth quirked up. Like you, princess. He seemed about to say something else, but then a branch snapped somewhere in the tangled darkness. He straightened quickly. Whoops, time to go. It's dangerous to linger in any one place. We'll attract unwanted attention. What? I exclaimed as he strode across the clearing, moving as gracefully as a deer. I thought you said this was home. The Never Never is home to all, Fay, Puck said without looking back. It's divided into territories, or more technically, courts. The Seely Court is Oberon's domain, while Mab rules the Unseely territories. While in the courts, it is usually forbidden to torment, maim, or kill another Fay without permission from its rulers. However, he continued, looking back at me, right now, we are in neutral territory home of the wild fae. Here, as you humans put it, all bets are off. The things coming at us now could be a herd of satyrs who will make you dance until you're exhausted, then rape you one by one. Or it could be a pack of hedge wolves that will tear us both apart. Either way, I don't think you want to hang around. I was afraid again. It seemed I was always afraid. I didn't want to be here, in this eerie forest, with this person I only thought I knew— I wanted to go home, only home had become a frightening place as well, almost as much as the never-never. I felt lost and betrayed, out of place in a world that wished me harm. Ethan, I reminded myself, you're doing this for Ethan. Once you get him, you can go home and everything will go back to normal. The rustling grew louder, and twigs snapped as whatever was out there drew closer. Princess? Puck snapped right next to me. I jumped and bit down a shriek as he grabbed my wrist. The aforementioned nasties have picked up our scent and are coming for us. 
Though his voice was casual, I could see the strain in his eyes. If you don't want your first day in the never-never to be your last, I suggest we move. I looked back and saw the door we came through standing upright in the middle of the clearing. Will we be able to get back home this way? I asked as Puck pulled me along. Nope. When I stared at him in horror, he shrugged. Well, you can't expect the doors to stand around in one place, princess. Don't worry, though. You have me, remember? When the time comes, we'll find the way home. We ran for the far side of the clearing, straight for a tangle of bushes with hooked yellow thorns as long as my thumb. I held back, sure we'd be sliced to ribbons, but as we neared, the branches shivered and peeled away from us, revealing a narrow path cutting through the trees. As we stepped through, the bushes knitted together again, hiding the trail and protecting our retreat. We walked for hours, or at least it felt that way to me. Puck kept up a steady pace, neither hurrying nor slowing down, and in time the sounds of pursuit faded away. Sometimes the trail split, wending off in different directions, but Puck always chose a path without hesitation. Many times I'd catch movement from the corner of my eye, a flash of color in the brush, a figure silhouetted between the trees, but when I turned, there'd be nothing. Sometimes I almost swore I heard singing or music, but, of course, it would fade when I tried to focus on it. The sickly luminescence of the forest never dimmed or brightened, and when I asked Puck what time night would fall, he cocked an eyebrow at me and said night would come when it was ready. Annoyed, I checked my watch, wondering how long we'd been traveling. I received an unpleasant shock. The slender hands were frozen in place, Either the watch's battery was dead, or something else was interfering. Or maybe time doesn't exist in this place. I don't know why I found that immensely disturbing, but I did. My feet were aching, my stomach hurt, and my legs were burning with exhaustion when the eternal twilight finally began to dim. Puck stopped, gazing up at the sky where an enormous moon glimmered over the treetops, so close you could see pits and craters marring the surface. I suppose we should rest for the night. Puck sounded reluctant. He gave me a sideways grin as I collapsed on a moldy log. We wouldn't want you stumbling onto a dancing mound or following a white bunny down a dark hole. Come on, I know a place not far from here where we can sleep undisturbed. He took my hand and pulled me to my feet. My limbs screamed in protest, and I almost sat down again. I was tired, cranky, and the last thing I wanted was more hiking. Gazing around, I saw a lovely little pond through a strand of trees. The water shimmered in the moonlight. And I paused, gazing out over the mirrored surface. Why not stop there? I asked. Puck took one look at the pond, grimaced, and pulled me onward. Uh, no, he said quickly. Too many nasties lurking underwater. Kelpies and glass digs and mermaids and such. Best not to risk it. I looked back and saw a dark shape breach the perfect surface of the pond, sending ripples across the still water. The top of a horse's head, coal black and slick like a seal, watched me with baleful white eyes. With a gasp, I hurried on. A few minutes later, we came to the trunk of a huge, gnarled tree. The bark was so knobby and rough that I could almost see faces peering out of the trunk. It reminded me of wrinkled old men, stacked atop each other and waving their crooked arms indignantly. Puck knelt among the roots and knocked on the wood. I peered over his shoulder and, with a start, saw a tiny door, barely a foot tall, near the base of the tree. As I watched, wide-eyed, the door creaked open, and a head peered out suspiciously. Eh? Yeah? Who's there? A rough, squeaky voice asked as I stared in wonder. The little man's skin was the color of walnuts. His hair looked like a bundle of twigs sticking out of his scalp. He wore a brown tunic and brown leggings, and looked like a stick come to life, except for the eyes peering out of his face, black and shiny like a beetle's. Good evening, twigs. Puck greeted politely. The little man blinked, squinting up at the figure towering over him. Robin Goodfellow, he squeaked at last. Haven't seen you around these parts in a while. What brings you to my humble tree? 
escort service, Puck replied, shifting to the side so that Twigs could get a clear view of me. Those beady eyes fixed on me, blinking in confusion. Then, suddenly, they got huge and round as Twigs looked back at Puck. Is... is that... It is. Does she? No. Oh, my. Twigs opened the door wide, beckoning with a stick-like arm. Come in, come in, quickly now, before the dryads catch sight of you, the irritating gossips. He vanished inside, and Puck turned to me. I'll never be able to fit in there, I told him before he could say a word. There's no way I'm going to squeeze through unless you've got a magic toadstool that'll shrink me to the size of a wasp, and I'm not eating anything like that. I've seen Alice in Wonderland, you know. Puck grinned and took my hand. Close your eyes, he told me, and just walk. I did, half expecting to walk nose first into the tree, courtesy of a great Robbie prank. When nothing happened, I almost peeked, but thought better of it. The air turned warm and I heard a door slam behind me when Puck said I could open my eyes again. I stood in a cozy, round room, the walls made of smooth redwood, the floor covered with mossy carpet. A flat rock on three stumps served as a table in the center of the room, displaying berries the size of soccer balls. A rope ladder hung on the far wall, and when my gaze followed it up, I nearly fainted. Dozens of insects crawled on the walls or hovered in the air high above us, for the trunk extended farther than I could see. Each bug was the size of a cocker spaniel, and their rear ends glowed a luminescent yellow-green. You've been renovating twigs, Puck said, sitting on a bundle of furs that passed for a couch. I looked closer and saw the head of a squirrel still attached to the skin and had to look away. This place was barely a hole in the tree when I saw it last. Twigs looked pleased. He was our height now. Actually, I guess we were more his height. And up close, he smelled of cedar and moss. Yes, I've grown quite fond of it, Twigs said, walking over to the table. He picked up a knife and split a berry into thirds, arranging the pieces on wooden plates. Still, I might have to move soon. The dryads whisper to me, tell me dark things. They say parts of the wild wood are dying, vanishing more every day. No one knows what's causing it. You know what's causing it, Puck said, draping the squirrel tail over his lap. We all do. This is nothing new. No. Twig shook his head. Mortal disbelief has always taken a bit of the never-never, but not like this. This is different. It's hard to explain. You'll see what I mean if you go any farther. He handed us each a plate with a huge slab of red berry, half an acorn, and a pile of what looked like steamed white grubs. Despite the weirdness of the day, I was ravenous after hours of hiking. The berry wedge tasted tart and sweet, but I wasn't about to touch the maggoty-looking things and gave them all to Puck. After dinner, Twigs made me a bed of squirrel hides and chipmunk fur, and though I was mildly grossed out, I fell asleep immediately. That night I dreamed. In my dream, my house was dark and still, the living room cloaked in shadow. A brief glimpse of the wall clock pronounced it 3.19 a.m. I floated through the living room, past the kitchen, and made my way up the stairs. The door to my room was closed, and I heard Luke's grizzly bear snores coming from the master bedroom. But at the end of the hall, Ethan's door stood slightly ajar. I padded down the hallway and peeked in through the crack. A stranger stood in Ethan's bedroom, a tall, lean figure dressed in silver and black. A boy, perhaps a little older than me, though it was impossible to tell his exact age. His body was youthful, but there was a stillness to him that hinted at something far older, something incredibly dangerous. With a shock, I recognized him as the boy on the horse who had watched me through the forest that day. Why was he here now, in my house? How did he even get in? I toyed with the idea of confronting him, knowing this was all a dream, when I noticed something else, something that made my blood run cold. 
Thick, raven-wing hair tumbled to his shoulders, not quite covering the delicate, pointed ears. He wasn't human. He was one of them. One of the fae. Standing in my house, in my brother's bedroom. I shuddered and began to ease back down the hall. He turned then, looking right through me, and I would have gasped if I had the breath. He was gorgeous. More than gorgeous. He was beautiful. Regal beautiful. Prince of a foreign nation beautiful. If he walked into my classroom during finals, students and teachers alike would be throwing themselves at his feet. Still, it was a cold, hard beauty, like that of a marble statue, inhuman and otherworldly. His slanted eyes, beneath long, jagged bangs, glimmered like chips of steel. The changeling was nowhere to be seen, but I could hear faint noises coming from beneath the bed, the thud of a rapidly beating heart. The fay boy didn't seem to notice. He turned and placed one pale hand on the closet door, running his fingers down the faded wood. A ghost of a smile touched his lips. In one smooth motion, he pushed the door open and walked through. The door shut behind him with a soft click, and he was gone. Warily, I edged toward the closet door, keeping a careful eye on the space beneath the bed. I still heard muffled heartbeats, but nothing reached out to grab at me. I crossed the room without incident. As quietly as I could, I grasped the closet doorknob, turned it, and pulled the door open. My closet, shrieked the bowler hat man, leaping out at me. Mine. I screamed and jerked myself awake. For a moment, I glared wildly around the room, not knowing where I was. My heart pounded, and a cold sweat made my forehead clammy and slick. Scenes from a vivid nightmare danced across my mind. Ethan attacking me, Robbie making books fly around the room, a portal opening to an eerie new world. A loud snore caught my attention, and I turned. Puck was sprawled out on the couch across from me, one arm flung over his eyes, his torso wrapped in a squirrel blanket. My heart sank as the memories came flooding back. This wasn't a nightmare. I hadn't been dreaming this. Ethan was gone. A monster had replaced him. Robbie was a fairy. And I was in the middle of the never-never searching for my brother, though I had no idea where to look and no real hope of finding him. I lay back, shivering. It was dark in Twig's home, the fireflies, or whatever they were, had stopped blinking and were now clinging to the walls, apparently asleep. The only light came from a flickering orange glow outside the window. Maybe Twigs had the porch light on or something. I bolted upright. That glow was actually candlelight, and above it, a face was peering into the room from outside. I opened my mouth to yell for Puck when those blue eyes turned to me and a face I knew all too well backed away into the night. Ethan. I scrambled out of bed and sprinted across the floor, not bothering to put on my shoes. Puck snorted and shifted under his mound of furs, but I ignored him. Ethan was out there. If I could get to him, we could go home and forget this mess ever existed. I yanked on the door and stepped out, scanning the woods for my brother. Only later did it occur to me that I was normal size again, and that the door was still only a foot tall. All I could think about was Ethan and getting him home. Getting us both home. Darkness greeted me. But up ahead, I saw a flickering orange glow bouncing along, getting steadily farther away. Ethan! I called, my voice echoing into the stillness. Ethan! Wait! I started to run, my bare feet slapping against leaves and branches, slipping on rocks and mud. My toe hit something sharp, and it should have hurt, but my mind didn't register the pain. I could see him up ahead, a small figure making his way through the trees, holding a candle out before him. I ran as fast as I could, branches scraping my skin and tearing at my hair and clothes, but it seemed he was always the same distance away. Then he stopped and looked back over his shoulder smiling. The flickering candlelight cast his features in an eerie glow. 
I put on a burst of speed and was just a few feet away when the ground suddenly dropped away from me. With a shriek, I plummeted like a stone, landing with a splash in icy water that closed over my head, flooding my nose and mouth. Gasping, I floundered to the surface, my face stinging and my limbs already numb. Above me, a giggle rang out, and a glowing ball of light hovered overhead. It dangled there a moment, as if enjoying my humiliation, then sped away into the trees, high-pitched laughter echoing behind it. Treading water, I gazed around. A muddy bank rose above me, slick and treacherous. There were several old trees growing out over the water, but their branches were too high for me to reach. I tried finding handholds in the bank to pull myself out, but my feet slipped in the mud, and the plants I grabbed came loose from the soil, dumping me into the lake with a noisy splash. I'd have to find another way out. And then I heard another splash, farther out, and I knew I wasn't alone. Moonlight shone upon the water, painting everything in a relief of silver and black, except for the buzzing of insects, the night was very still. On the far side of the lake, Fireflies danced and whirled above the surface, some glowing pink and blue instead of yellow. Maybe I'd only imagined I'd heard a noise. Nothing seemed to be moving except for an old log drifting toward me. I blinked and looked again. That log suddenly looked a lot like the top half of a horse's head, if a horse could swim like an alligator. And then I saw the dead white eyes, the thin shiny teeth, and panic rose up in me like a black tide. Puck! I screamed, scrabbling at the bank. Mud tore loose in clumps. I'd find a handhold only to slip back again. I could feel the thing draw closer. Puck! Help me! I looked over my shoulder. The horse thing was only a few feet away, raising its neck out of the water to expose a mouthful of needle-like teeth. Oh, God, I'm going to die. That thing is going to eat me. Somebody help. I clawed frantically at the bank and felt a solid branch under my fingers. Grasping it, I yanked with all my strength and felt the branch lift me out of the water, just as the horse monster lunged with a roar. Its wet, rubbery nose hit the bottom of my foot, jaws snapping with an evil snick. Then the branch flung me, gasping and crying to the bank, and the horse thing sank below the surface once more. Puck found me minutes later, curled into a ball several yards from the bank, wet to the skin and shaking like a leaf. His eyes were a mix of sympathy and exasperation as he pulled me upright. Are you all right? He ran his hands up my arms, making sure I was still in one piece. Still in there, princess? Talk to me. I nodded, shivering. I saw Ethan, I stammered, trying to make sense of it all. I followed him, but he turned into a light and flew away, and then this horse thing tried to eat me. I trailed off. That wasn't Ethan, was it? That was just another fairy playing with my emotions. And I fell for it. Puck sighed and led me back down the trail. Yeah, he muttered, glancing back at me. Wisps are like that, making you see what you want to see before leading you off the path. Though, that one seemed particularly spiteful, leading you right to a Kelpie's pond. I suppose I could tell you never to go off alone, but I think it'd be a waste of breath. Oh, what the hell? He stopped and whirled around, stopping me in my tracks. Don't go off alone, princess. Under any circumstances, understand? In this world, you're viewed as either a plaything or a light snack. Don't forget that. Yeah, I muttered. Yeah, I get that now. We continued down the trail. The door in the knobby tree was gone, but my sneakers and backpack lay outside. A clear sign our welcome was over. Shivering, I slipped the shoes over my bloody feet, hating this world and everything in it wanting only to go home. Well, Puck said too cheerfully, if you're done playing with the Will-o'-the-Wisps and Kelpies, I think we should continue. Oh, but do tell me the next time you want to have tea with an ogre, I'll be sure to bring my club. I shot him a poisonous glare. He only grinned. 
Above us, the sky was lightening into that eerie gray twilight, silent and still as death, as we ventured deeper into the never-never. Chapter 6 The Wild Hunt We hadn't gotten far when we came upon the patch of death in the middle of the forest. The Wildwood was an eerie, quiet place, but it was still alive— Trees stood ancient and tall, plants bloomed, and splashes of vibrant color pierced the grayness, indicating life. Animals slipped through the trees, and strange creatures moved about in the shadows. You never got a clearer view of them, but you knew they were there. You could feel them, watching you. Then, all of a sudden, the trees dropped away, and we stood at the edge of a barren clearing— what little grass remained was yellow and dying, sparse patches of vegetation in the rocky ground. A few trees were scattered here and there, but they were withered, twisted things, empty of leaves and blackened. From a distance, the branches glinted, jagged and sharp, like weird metal sculptures. The hot wind smelled of copper and dust. Puck stared at the dead forest for a long time. Twigs was right, he muttered staring at a withered tree. He made as if to touch one of the branches, but withdrew his hand with a shudder. This isn't natural. Something is poisoning the wildwood. I reached up to touch one of the glittering branches and jerked back with a gasp. Ouch! Puck whirled on me. What? I showed him my hand. Blood welled from a slice in my finger, thin as a paper cut. The tree. It cut me. Puck examined my finger and frowned. Metallic trees, he mused, pulling a hanky from his pocket and wrapping it around my finger. That's new. If you see any steel dryads, be sure to tell me so I can run away, screaming. I scowled and looked back at the tree. A single drop of blood glistened on the offending branch before dropping to the cracked earth. The twigs gleamed along their edges, as if honed to fine blades. Oberon must know about this, Puck muttered, crouching to examine a circle of dry grass. Twig said it was spreading, but where is it coming from? He rose quickly and swayed on his feet, putting out a hand to steady himself. I grabbed his arm. Are you all right? I asked. I'm fine, princess. He nodded and gave me a pained smile. A little perturbed about the state of my home, but what can you do? He coughed and waved a hand in front of his face, as if he smelled something foul. But this air is making me sick. Let's get out of here. I sniffed, but smelled nothing bad, just dirt and the sharp tang of something metallic, like rust. But Puck was already leaving, his brow furrowed in anger or pain, and I hurried to catch up. The howling began a few hours later. Puck stopped in the middle of the trail so abruptly that I nearly ran into him. He held up a hand, silencing me, before I could ask what was going on. I heard it then, drifting over the breeze, a chorus of chilling bays and howls echoing behind us. My heart revved up, and I inched closer to my companion. What is that? A hunt, Puck replied, looking off into the distance. He grimaced. You know, I was just thinking we needed to be run down like rabbits and torn apart. My day just isn't complete without something trying to kill me. I grew cold. Something's after us? You've never seen a wild hunt, have you? Puck groaned, running his fingers through his hair. Damn. Well, this will complicate things. I was hoping to give you the grand tour of the Never Never Princess, but I guess I'll have to put it on hold. The baying grew closer, deep, throaty howls. Whatever was coming at us, it was big. Shouldn't we run? I whispered. You'll never be able to outrun them, Puck said, backing away. They've got our scent now, and no mortal has ever escaped a wild hunt. He sighed and dramatically flung his arms over his eyes. I guess the sacrifice of my dignity is the only thing that will save us now. The things I endure for love... The fates laugh at my torment. What are you talking about? Puck smiled his eerie little grin and began to change. His face stretched out, becoming longer and narrower, as his neck began to grow. His arms spasmed, 
fingers turning black and fusing into hooves. He arched his back, spine expanding as his legs became hindquarters, bunched with muscle. Fur covered his skin as he dropped to all fours, no longer a boy, but a sleek gray horse with a shaggy mane and tail. The transformation had taken less than ten seconds. I backed up, remembering my encounter with the thing in the water, but the dappled horse stamped its foreleg and swished its tail impatiently. I saw its eyes, shining like emeralds through the dangling forelocks, and my fear abated somewhat. The howling was very close now, growing more and more frenzied. I ran to horse Puck and threw myself on his back, grabbing his mane to heave myself up. Despite living on a farm, I'd only been on horseback once or twice, and it took me a couple of tries to get up. Puck snorted and tossed his head, annoyed with my lack of equestrian skills. Struggling upright, I grasped the mane and saw Puck's eyes roll back at me. Then, with a half rear, we plunged into the bushes and were off. Riding bareback is not fun, especially when you have no control over your mount or where it's going. I can honestly say this was the most terrifying ride of my life. The trees flashed by in a blur, branches slapped at me, and my legs burned from gripping the horse's sides with my knees. My fingers were locked around his mane in a death grip, but that didn't keep me from sliding halfway off whenever Puck changed direction. The wind shrieked in my ears, but I could still hear the terrifying bays of our pursuers, seemingly right on our heels. I didn't dare look back. I lost track of time. Puck never slowed or grew winded, but sweat darkened his body and made my seating slick and even more terrifying. My legs grew numb, and my hands seemed to belong to somebody else. And then a huge black creature burst from the ferns to our right and lunged at the horse, snapping its jaws. It was a hound, bigger than any I'd seen, with eyes of blue fire. Puck leaped aside to avoid it and reared, nearly spilling me to the forest floor. As I screamed, one foreleg slashed out, striking the hound in the chest mid-leap, and the dog yelped as it was hurled away. The bushes exploded, and five more monstrous dogs spilled into the road. Surrounding us, they snarled and howled, snapping at the horse's legs and leaping back as he kicked at them. I was frozen, clinging to Puck's back, watching as those massive jaws clicked shut inches from my dangling feet. Then, through the trees, I saw him, a lean figure on a huge black horse, the boy from my dream, the one I saw from the bus that day. His cruel, angelic face wore a smile as he drew back a large bow, an arrow glistening at the tip. Puck! I screeched, knowing it was already too late. Look out! The leaves above the hunter rustled, and then a large branch swept down, striking the boy in the arm just as he released the string. I felt the hum as the arrow zipped past my head and lodged into a pine tree. A spider web of frost spread out from where the arrow hit, and Puck's equine head whipped toward the source. The hunter fit another arrow in the string, and with a shrill whinny, Puck reared and leaped over the dogs, somehow avoiding their snapping teeth. When his hooves struck dirt again, he fled, the hounds barking and snapping at his heels. An arrow whistled past, and I looked back to see the other horse pursuing us through the trees, its rider reaching back for another shot. Puck snorted and switched directions, nearly unseating me, plunging into a deeper part of the forest. The trees here were monsters, and grew so close together that Puck had to swerve and weave around them. The hounds fell back, but I still heard their bays and occasionally caught a glimpse of their lean black bodies hurtling through the undergrowth. The rider had disappeared, but I knew he still followed, his deadly arrows ready to pierce our hearts. As we passed under the boughs of an enormous oak, Puck skidded to a halt, then bucked so violently that I flew off his back, my hands torn from his mane. I soared over his head, my stomach in my throat, and landed with a jarring impact in a crossbeam of connecting branches. My breath exploded from my lungs, and a stab of pain shot through my ribs, bringing tears to my eyes. With a snort, Puck galloped on, the dogs following him into the shadows. Moments later, the black horse and rider passed under the tree. He slowed for a chilling heartbeat, and I held my breath, sure he would look up and see me.
Then the excited howl of one of the dogs rang through the air, and he spurred his horse onward, following the hunt into the trees. In a moment, the sounds had faded. Silence fell through the branches, and I was alone. Well, someone said very close by, that was interesting. Chapter 7 Of Goblins and Grimalkin I didn't scream this time, but came very close. As it was, I nearly fell out of the tree. Hugging a branch, I looked around wildly, trying to determine the owner of the voice. But I glimpsed nothing but leaves and sickly gray light shining through the branches. Where are you? I gasped. Show yourself. I am not hiding, little girl. The voice sounded amused. Perhaps if you open your eyes a bit wider, like this. Directly in front of me, not five feet away, a pair of saucer-like eyes opened up out of nowhere, and I stared into the face of an enormous gray cat. There, it purred, regarding me with a lazy yellow gaze. Its fur was long and wispy, blending perfectly into the tree and the entire landscape. See me now? You're a cat. I blurted stupidly, and I swore it arched a brow at me. In the crudest sense of the word, I suppose you could call me that. The feline rose, arching its back, before sitting and curling its plumed tail around its legs. Now that my shock was fading, I realized the cat was a he, not an it. Others have called me Cat-She, Grimalkin, and Devil's Cat. But, since they all mean the same, I suppose you would be correct. I gaped at him, but the sharp throb of my ribs returned my mind to other things. Namely, that Puck had left me alone in this world that viewed me as a snack, and I had no idea how to survive. Shock and anger came first. Puck had really left me to save his own skin? And after that came a fear so real and terrifying, it was all I could do not to hug the branch and sob. How could Puck do this to me? I'd never make it out on my own. I'd end up as dessert for a carnivorous horse monster, torn apart by a pack of wolves, or hopelessly lost for decades. Because I was sure time had ceased to exist, and I'd be stuck here forever. I took a deep breath, forcing myself to be calm. No. Robbie wouldn't do that to me, I'm sure of it. Perhaps he ditched me to lead the hunt away, to make sure the hunt followed him and left me alone. Maybe he thought he was saving my life. Maybe he had saved my life. If that was the case, I hoped he came back soon. I didn't think I would get out of the never-never without him. Grimalkin, or whatever his name was, continued to observe me as if I was a particularly interesting insect. I eyed him with new feelings of suspicion. Sure, he looked like an enormous, slightly plump house cat, but horses weren't generally meat eaters, and normal trees did not have little men living inside. The feline could be sizing me up for its next meal. I gulped and met his eerie, intelligent gaze head on. W what do you want? I asked, thankful that my voice only trembled a little bit. The cat didn't blink. Human, he said. And if a cat could sound patronizing, this one nailed it. Think about the absurdity of that question. I am resting in my tree, minding my own business, and wondering what I should hunt today. When you come flying in like a banshee and scare off every bird for miles around, then you have the audacity to ask what I want? He sniffed and gave me a very cat-like stare of disdain. I am aware that mortals are rude and barbaric, but still. I'm sorry, I muttered automatically. I didn't mean to offend you. Grimalkin twitched his tail and then turned to groom his hindquarters. Um, I continued after a moment of silence. I was wondering if maybe you could help me. Grimalkin paused mid-lick, then continued without looking up. And why would I want to do that? 
he asked, weaving words and grooming together without missing a beat. He still didn't look at me. I'm trying to find my brother, I replied, stung by Grimalkin's casual refusal. He's been stolen by the Unseelie Court. Hmm, how terribly interesting. Please, I begged. Help me. Give me a hint or just point me in the right direction. Anything. I'll make it up to you, I swear. Grimalkin yawned, showing off long canines and a bright pink tongue, and finally looked at me. Are you suggesting I do you a favor? Yes, look, I'll pay you back somehow, I promise. He twitched an ear, looking amused. Be careful throwing those words around so casually, he warned. Doing this will put you in my debt. Are you sure you wish to continue? I didn't think about it. I was so desperate for help I'd agree to anything. Yes, please, I need to find Puck, the horse I was riding when he bucked me off. He's not really a horse, you know. He's a... I know what he is, Grimalkin said quietly. Really? Oh, that's great. Do you know where he could have gone? He fixed me with an unblinking stare and then lashed his tail once. Without a word, he rose, leaping gracefully onto a lower limb and dropped to the ground. He stretched, arching his bushy tail over his spine and vanished into the bushes without looking back. I yelped, scrambling to untangle myself from the branches, wincing at the shard of pain between my ribs. I more or less fell out of the tree, landing with a thump on my backside that sparked a word Mom would ground me for. Dusting off my rear, I looked around for Grimalkin. Human. He appeared like a gray ghost sliding out of the bushes, big glowing eyes the only evidence he was there. This is our agreement. I will lead you to your puck, and you will owe me a small favor in return. Yes? Something about the way he said agreement caused my skin to prickle, but I nodded. Very well, then. Follow me, and do try to keep up. Easier said than done. If you've ever tried following a cat through a dense forest filled with briars, bushes, and tangled undergrowth, you'll know how impossible it is. I lost track of the times Grimalkin vanished from sight, and I'd spent a few heart-pounding minutes searching for him, hoping I was going the right way. I always felt a desperate relief when I'd finally catch a glimpse of him slinking through the trees ahead, only to go through the same thing minutes later. It didn't help that my mind was occupied with what could have happened to Puck. Was he dead, shot down by the dark fay boy and ripped apart by the hounds? Or had he really fled, already resolved that he wasn't coming back for me, and I could take my chances on my own? Fear and anger welled, and my sullen thoughts shifted to my present guide. Grimalkin seemed to know the path we should take, but how did he know where Puck would be? Why should I trust him? What if the devious feline was leading me into some sort of trap? As I was entertaining these bleak thoughts, Grimalkin disappeared again. Damn it, I'm going to tie a bell around the stupid thing's neck if it doesn't stop that. The light was fading, and the forest was even more gray. I stopped and squinted at the bushes, searching for the elusive feline. Up ahead, the bushes rustled, which surprised me. Grimalkin had been completely silent up until now. Human, whispered a familiar voice somewhere above me. Hide. What? I said, but it was too late. Twigs snapped, bushes parted, and a slew of creatures spilled into view. They were short, ugly things standing two or three feet high, with knobby yellow-green skin and bulbous noses. Their ears were large and pointed. They wore tattered clothing and carried bone-tipped spears and yellow claws. Their faces were mean and cruel, with beady eyes and mouths full of broken, jagged teeth. For a moment, they stopped, blinking in surprise. Then the whole pack of them screeched and swarmed forward, jabbing at me with their spears. What is it? What is it? Snarled one as I cringed away from the stabbing points. Laughter and jeers filled the air as they surrounded me. It's an elf, hissed another, giving me a toothy leer. An elf that's lost its ears, maybe. No, a goat girl, 
cried yet a third. Good eatin' them. She ain't no goat, Cretan. Look it, she ain't got no ooves. I trembled and looked around for an escape route, but wherever I turned, those sharp bony points were thrust at me. Take her to the chief, someone suggested at last. The chief'll know what she is, and if she's safe to eat. Right, the chief'll know. A couple of them rushed me from behind, and I felt a blow to the back of my knees. With a shriek, I collapsed, and the whole pack of them swarmed me, hooting and hollering. I screamed and kicked, flailing my arms, thrashing under the weight of the creatures. A few went flying into the bushes, but they bounced up with shrill cries and pounced on me again. Blows rained down on me. Then something struck me behind the head, making lights explode behind my eyes, and I knew nothing for a time. I woke with the mother of all headaches, doing a jig inside my skull. I was in a sitting position, and something that felt like broom handles pressed uncomfortably into my back. Groaning, I probed around my skull, searching for anything cracked or broken. Except for a massive lump just above my hairline, everything seemed to be intact. When I was sure I was still in one piece, I opened my eyes, and I regretted it immediately. I was in a cage, a very small cage, made of branches lashed together with leather bindings. There was barely enough room for me to raise my head, and when I moved, something sharp poked me in the arm, drawing blood. I looked closer and saw that many of the branches were covered in thorns about an inch long. Beyond the bars, several mud huts sat in no particular arrangement around a large fire pit, the squat, ugly little creatures scampered to and fro around the camp, fighting, arguing, and gnawing on bones. A group of them sat around my backpack, pulling things out one by one. My extra clothes they just tossed in the dirt, but the chips and the bottle of aspirin they immediately ripped open, tasted, and squabbled over. One managed to open the soda can and spray fizzy liquid everywhere to the angry shrieks of his companions. One of them, shorter than its fellows, and wearing a muddy red vest, saw that I was awake. With a hiss, it scuttled up to the cage and thrust its spear through the bars. I cringed back, but there was nowhere to go. The thorn stung my flesh as the spear jabbed me in the thigh. Ouch! Stop it! I cried, which only encouraged it further. Cackling, it poked and prodded me until I reached down and grabbed the head of the spear, Snarling and cursing, the creature tried yanking it back, and we held a ridiculous tug of war until another goblin saw what we were doing. It rushed up and stabbed me through the bars on the opposite side, and I released the spear with a yelp. Greer, take, stop poking the meat, snapped the second, taller creature. Ain't no good if all the blood runs out. Pa, I was just making sure it was tender as all. The other snorted and spit on the ground, then glared at me with greedy red eyes. Why we waiting about? Let's just eat it already. The chief ain't back yet. The taller creature looked at me, and to my horror, a long string of drool dripped down its chin. He has to make sure the thing is safe to eat. They gave me a last longing glare, then stomped back to the fire pit, arguing and spitting at each other. I drew my knees to my chest and tried to control my shaking. If you are going to cry, please do it quietly, murmured a familiar voice at my back. Goblins can smell fear. They will only torment you more if you give them a reason. Grimalkin? Squirming in my cage, I glanced around to see the nearly invisible gray cat crouched by one corner, his eyes were narrowed in concentration, and his long, sharp teeth were chewing at one of the leather bindings. Idiot, do not look at me, he spat, and I quickly glanced away. The cat growled, tugging on one of the bars. Goblins are not very smart, but even they will notice if you start talking to nobody. Just sit tight, and I will have you out of here in a minute. Thank you for coming back, I whispered watching two goblins fight over some unfortunate beast's rib cage. The quarrel ended when one goblin bashed the other over the head with a club and scampered off with its trophy. The other goblin lay stunned for a moment, then leaped to its feet in pursuit. Grimalkin sniffed and began chewing the bindings again. 
Do not put yourself even more in debt, he said around a mouthful of leather. We have already made a contract. I agreed to take you to Puck, and I always keep my end of the bargain. Now, shut up, so I can work. I nodded and fell silent, but suddenly there was a great cry in the goblin camp. Goblins leaped to their feet, hissing and scuttling about, as a large creature sauntered out of the forest into the middle of the encampment. It was another goblin, only bigger, broader, and meaner looking than its fellows. It wore a crimson uniform with brass buttons, the sleeves rolled up, and the tails dragging along the ground. It also carried a curved blade, rusty bronze and jagged along the edge. It snarled and swaggered into the camp, the other goblins cringing away from it, and I knew this must be the chief. Shut up, ya pack of jabbering dogs, the chief roared, aiming a blow at a couple of goblins who didn't get out of his way quick enough. Worthless, the lot of ya. I been hard at work raiding the borderlands, and what have you got to show me, eh? Nothing, not even a rabbit for the stew pot. You make me sick. Chief, chief, cried several goblins at once, dancing around and pointing. Look it, look it, we caught something, we brought it back for you. Eh? The chief's gaze flashed across the camp, his evil eyes fastening on me. What's this? Did you miserable louts actually manage to catch a high and mighty elf? He sauntered toward the cage. I couldn't help myself and snuck a quick glance at Grimalkin, hoping the cat would flee. But Grimalkin was nowhere to be seen. Swallowing hard, I looked up and met the chief's beady red eyes. What in Pan's privates is this? The goblin chief snorted. This ain't no elf, you cretins. Not unless she bartered away her ears. Besides, he sniffed the air, wrinkling his snotty nose. It smells different. Aye, funny elf thing. He smacked the cage with the flat of his sword, making me jump. What are ya? I took a deep breath as the rest of the goblin tribe crowded around the cage, watching me, some curious, most hungry-looking. I'm a... an... otaku fairy, I said, drawing a confused scowl from the chief and bewildered looks from the rest of the camp. Whispers began to erupt from the crowd, gaining strength like wildfire. A what? Ain't never heard of that before. Is it tasty? Can we eat it? The chief frowned. I admit, I ain't never come across no otaku fairy before. He growled, scratching his head. Ah, but that ain't important. You look young and juicy enough. I figure you'll feed me crew for several nights. So, what's your preference, otaku? He grinned and raised his sword. Boiled alive or skewered over the fire? I clenched my hands to stop them from shaking. Either way is fine with me, I said, trying to sound casual. Tomorrow won't matter at all. There's a deadly poison running through my veins. If you swallow one bite of me... Your blood will boil, your insides will melt, and you'll dissolve into a steaming pile of muck. Hisses went around the tribe. Several goblins bared their teeth at me and snarled. I crossed my arms and raised my chin, staring down the goblin chief. So? Go ahead and eat me. Tomorrow you'll be a big pile of goo, sinking into the ground. Many of the goblins were backing away now. But the chief stood firm. Shut up, you sniveling lot, he snarled at the nervous goblins. Giving me a sour look, he spat on the ground. So, we can eat ya. He sounded unimpressed. Pity that is, but don't think that'll save ya, girl. 
If you're so deadly, I'll just kill you now. Except I'll bleed you slow, so your poison blood won't hurt me. Then I'll skin you and hang your hide on me door, and use your bones for arrowheads, as me grandmother always said, waste not. Wait, I cried as he stepped forward, raising his sword. It, it would be a shame for me to go to waste like that. I stammered as he glared at me with suspicious eyes. There is a way to purify the poison from my blood so that I'm safe to eat. If I'm going to die anyway, I'd rather be eaten than tortured. The goblin chief smiled. I knew you'd see it my way, he gloated. Turning to his minions, he puffed out his chest. See there, dogs. Your chief is still looking out for ya. We feast tonight. A raucous cheer went up, and the chief turned to me again, leveling his sword at my face. So then, Otaku girl, what's your secret? I thought quickly. To cleanse the poison from my blood, you have to boil me in a big pot with several purifying ingredients. Spring water from a waterfall, an acorn from the tallest oak tree, blue mushrooms, and, um, don't tell me you forgot, the chief said in a menacing tone, and poked the sword tip through the bars of the cage. Maybe I can help you remember. Pixie dust, I blurted desperately, making him blink. From a live pixie, I added. Not dead. If it dies, the recipe won't work. I prayed that there were pixies in this world. If not, I was as good as dead. Huh. The chief grunted and turned to the waiting tribe. All right, louts, you heard it. I want those ingredients back here before dawn. Anyone who don't work, don't eat. Now get moving. The tribe scattered, hissing, jabbering, and cursing at one another. They vanished into the forest until only one guard remained, leaning on a crooked spear. The chief eyed me warily and pointed his sword through the bars. Don't think you can trick me by giving false ingredients, he threatened. I plan to cut off your finger, toss it in the stew, and have one of me mates taste it. If he dies or melts into a puddle, it'll be a long, slow death for you. Understand? Chilled, I nodded. I knew none of the goblins would die, because my claim of poison and the recipe for the stew was, of course, completely bogus. Still, I wasn't thrilled about losing one of my fingers. Terrified would be a better word. The chief spat and looked around the near-deserted campsite. Bah! None of them dogs will know how to catch a pisky, he muttered, scratching his ear. They'd probably eat the damn thing if they caught it. Arg, I'd better find one myself. Bugrat. A few yards away, the lone guard snapped to attention. Chief? Keep your eye on our dinner, the chief ordered, sheathing his sword. If it tries to escape, cut off its feet. You got it, chief. I'm going hunting. The chief shot me one last warning glare, then bounded off into the undergrowth. That was clever, Grimalkin murmured, sounding reluctantly impressed. I nodded, too breathless to answer. After a moment, the sound of chewing recommenced. It took a while, during which time I chewed my lip, wrung my hands, and tried not to ask how Grimalkin was doing every twenty seconds. As the minutes stretched, I cast anxious glances at the trees and the forest, expecting the chief or the goblin horde to come bursting through. The lone guard stalked the perimeter of the camp, shooting me an evil look as it walked by and triggering Grimalkin's vanishing act. Finally, on the eighth or ninth circle, Grimalkin's voice floated up after the guard had passed. There. I think you can get through now. I wiggled around as best I could. Peering at the bars, I saw that several of the bindings were chewed in half, testament to Grimm's strong jaws and sharp teeth. Come on, come on, let us go, 
Grimalkin hissed, lashing its tail. You can gawk later. They are coming back. Bushes rustled around me, and harsh laughter filled the air, getting closer. Heart pounding, I grasped the bars, being careful to avoid the thorns and pushed. They resisted me, held in place by interlocking branches, and I shoved harder. It was like trying to push through a heavy briar patch. The bars shifted a bit, teasing me with freedom, but stubbornly gave little ground. The goblin chief stepped out of the trees, followed by three more goblins. He clutched something small and wriggling in one fist, and his followers' arms were filled with pale blue toadstools. Mushrooms were the easy part, the chief snorted, casting a derisive glance back at the others. Any idiot can collect plants. If I'd left these dogs to catch a pisky, we'd be nothing but bones before- He stopped, and his gaze snapped to me. For a moment, he stood there, blinking. Then his eyes narrowed, and he clenched his fists. The creature in his grasp gave a high-pitched squeal as the goblin crushed the life from it and flung it to the ground. With a roar of outrage, the chief drew his sword. I screamed and shoved on the cage as hard as I could. With a great snapping of twigs and thorns, the back of the cage came loose, and I was free. Run! Grimalkin yelled, and I didn't need encouragement. We bolted into the forest, the enraged cries of the goblins on our heels. Chapter 8 Moonlit Grove I tore through the forest, branches and leaves slapping at my face, following Grimalkin's shadowy form as best I could. Behind me, twigs snapped, snarls echoed, and the angry cursing of the goblin chief grew louder in my ears. My breath rasped in my chest, my lungs burned, but I forced my legs to keep moving, knowing that if I stumbled or fell, I would die. This way, I heard Grimalkin shout, darting into a patch of bramble. If we can get to the river, we will be safe. Goblins cannot swim. I followed him into the briars, bracing myself for thorns tearing at my flesh and ripping at my clothes. But the branches parted easily for me, as they had when I was with Puck, and I slipped through with minimal scrapes. As I exited the bramble patch, a great crashing noise echoed behind me, followed by loud yelps and swearing. It seemed the goblins weren't finding the path as easy to navigate, and I thanked whatever forces were at work as I continued on. Over the roaring in my ears and my own ragged breaths, I heard the sound of rushing water. When I staggered out of the trees, the ground abruptly dropped away into a rocky embankment. A great river loomed before me, nearly a hundred yards across, with no bridges or rafts in sight. I couldn't see the other side because a coiling wall of mist hovered over the water, stretching as far as I could see. Grimalkin stood at the edge, almost invisible in the fog, lashing his tail impatiently. Hurry, he ordered as I stumbled down the bank, exhaustion burning my legs. The Earl King's territory is on the other side. You must swim, quickly. I hesitated. If monster horses lurked in quiet ponds... What would great black rivers hold? Images of giant fish and sea monsters flashed across my mind. Something flew past my arm, startling me, bouncing off the rocks with a clatter. It was a goblin spear, the bone-white tip gleaming against the stones. The blood drained from my face. I could either stay put and be skewered, or take my chances with the river. Scrambling down the bank, I flung myself into the water. The cold shocked me, and I gasped, struggling against the current as it pulled me downstream. I'm a fairly strong swimmer, but my limbs felt like jelly, and my lungs were gasping to suck in enough oxygen. I floundered and went under, snorting water up my nose and making my lungs scream. The current pulled me farther away, and I fought down panic. Another lance zipped over my head, and I looked back and saw the goblins following me along the bank, scrambling over the rocks and hurling spears. Terror shot through me, giving me new strength. I struck out for the opposite shore, arms and legs churning madly, fighting the current for all I was worth. More spears splashed around me, but thankfully the goblins' aim seemed to match their intelligence. 
As I drew close to the wall of mist, something struck my shoulder with jarring force, sending a flare of agony across my back. I gasped and went under. Pain paralyzed my arm, and as the undertow dragged me down, I was sure I was going to die. Something grabbed my waist, and I felt myself pulled upward. My head broke water, and I gasped air into my starving lungs, fighting the blackness on the edge of my vision. As my senses returned, I realized someone was pulling me through the water, but I could see nothing around me because of the mist. Then my feet touched solid ground, and the next thing I knew, I was lying in the grass, the sun shining warmly on my face. My eyes were closed, and I cracked them open cautiously. A girl's face hovered over mine, blonde hair brushing my cheeks, wide green eyes both anxious and curious. Her skin was the color of summer grass, and tiny scales gleamed silver around her neck. She grinned, and her teeth flashed as sharp and pointed as an eel's. A scream welled in my throat, but I swallowed it down. This girl had just saved my life, even if it meant she wanted to eat me herself. It would be rude if I just shrieked in her face, plus any sudden moves might spark an aggressive feeding frenzy. I couldn't show any fear. With a deep breath, I sat up, wincing as a bolt of pain lanced through my shoulder. Um, hello, I stammered, watching her sit back and blink. I was surprised that she had legs instead of a fishtail, though webbing spanned her fingers and toes, and her claws were very, very sharp. A small white dress clung to her body, the hem of it dripping wet, I'm Megan. What's your name? She cocked her head, reminding me of a cat that couldn't decide whether to eat the mouse or play with it. You're funny looking, she stated, her voice rippling like water over rocks. What are you? Me? I'm human. The moment I said it, I wished I hadn't. In the old fairy tales, which I was remembering more and more of, humans were always food, playthings, or a tragic love interest. And, as I was quickly discovering, the inhabitants here had no qualms about eating a speaking, sentient creature. I held the same rung on the food chain as a rabbit or a squirrel. It was a scary, rather humbling thought. Human? The girl cocked her head the other way. I caught a glimpse of pink gills under her chin. My sisters told me stories of humans. They said they sometimes sing to them to lure them underwater. She grinned, showing off her sharp, needle teeth. I've been practicing. Want to hear? No, she certainly does not. Grimalkin came stalking through the grass, bottle brush tail held high in the air. The feline was soaked, water dripping off his fur in rivulets, and he did not look pleased. Shoo! He growled at the girl, and she drew back, hissing and baring her teeth. Grimalkin seemed unimpressed. Go away! I am in no mood to play games with Nixies. Now get! The girl hissed once more and fled, sliding into the water like a seal. She glared at us from the middle of the river, then vanished in a spray of mist. Irritating sirens, Grimalkin fumed, turning to glare at me, eyes narrowed. You did not promise her anything, did you? No, I bristled. I was happy to see the cat, of course, but didn't appreciate the attitude. It wasn't my fault the goblins were chasing us. You didn't have to scare her off, Grim. She did save my life. The cat flicked his tail, spraying me with drops. The only reason she pulled you out of the river was curiosity. If I had not come along, she would have either sung you underwater to drown, or she would have eaten you. Fortunately, Nixies are not very brave. They would much prefer a fight beneath the water where they have all the advantages. Now, I suggest we find somewhere to rest. You are wounded, and the swim took a lot out of me. If you can walk, I encourage you to do so. Grimacing, I pulled myself to my feet, 
My shoulder felt like it was on fire, but if I held my arm close to my chest, the pain receded to a dull throb. Biting my lip, I followed Grimalkin, away from the river and into the lands of the Earl King. Even wet, tired, and in pain, I still had the energy to gawk. Pretty soon, my eyes felt huge and swollen from staring so long without blinking. The land on this side of the river was a far cry from the eerie gray forest of the wild fay. Rather than colors being faded and washed out, everything was overly vibrant and vivid. The trees were too green, the flowers screamingly colorful. Leaves glittered, razor sharp in the light, and petals flashed like jewels as they caught the sun. It was all very beautiful, but I couldn't shake the feeling of apprehension as I took it in. Everything seemed fake, somehow, as if this was a fancy coating over reality, as if I wasn't looking at the real world at all. My shoulder burned, and the skin around it felt puffy and hot. As the sun rose higher in the sky, the throbbing heat leached down my arm and spread through my back. Sweat ran down my face, making my eyes sting, and my legs trembled. I finally collapsed under a pine tree gasping, my body hot and cold at the same time. Grimalkin circled around and trotted back, his tail held high in the air. For a moment, there were two Grimalkins, but then I blinked sweat out of my eyes and there was only one. There's something wrong with me, I panted as the cat regarded me coolly. His eyes abruptly floated off his face and hovered in the air between us. I blinked hard, and they were normal again. Grimalkin nodded. Dream lace venom, he said to my confusion. Goblins poison their spears and arrows. When the hallucinations start coming, you do not have long. I took a ragged breath. Isn't there a cure? I whispered, ignoring the fern that started crawling toward me like a leafy spider. Someone who can help? That is where we are going. Grimalkin stood, looking back at me. Not far now, human. Keep your eyes on me and try to ignore everything else, no matter what comes at you. It took three tries to get back on my feet, but at last I managed to pull myself up and hold my balance long enough to take a step, and then another, and another. I followed Grimalkin for miles, or at least it seemed that way. After the first tree lunged at me, rattling its branches, it became difficult to concentrate. I nearly lost Grimalkin several times as the landscape twisted into terrifying versions of itself, reaching for me with twiggy fingers. Distant shapes beckoned from the shadows, calling my name. The ground turned into a writhing mass of spiders and centipedes crawling up my legs. A deer stepped into the middle of the path, cocked its head, and asked me for the time. Grimalkin paused, jumping onto a rock, ignoring the boulder's indignant shouts for him to get off. He turned to face me. You are on your own from here, human, he said, or at least that's what I heard over the rock's bellowing. Just keep walking until he shows himself. He owes me a favor, but also tends to distrust humans, so the chances that he will help you are about fifty-fifty. Unfortunately, he is the only one who can cure you now. I frowned, trying to follow his words, but they buzzed around like flies and I couldn't follow. What are you talking about? I asked. You will know what I mean when you find him, if you find him. The cat cocked his head and gave me a scrutinizing look. You are still a virgin, right? I decided that last part was a figment of my delirium. Grimalkin slipped away before I could ask him anything else, leaving me confused and disoriented. Waving away a swarm of wasps that circled my head, I stumbled after him. A vine reached up and snagged my foot. I fell, bursting through the ground to land on a bed of yellow flowers. They turned their tiny faces to me and screamed, filling the air with pollen— I sat up and found myself in a moonlit grove, the ground carpeted with flowers. 
Trees danced, rocks laughed at me, and tiny lights zipped through the air. My limbs were numb, and I was suddenly very tired. Blackness crawled on the edge of my vision. I lay back against a tree and watched the lights swarm through the air. Vaguely, some part of me realized I'd stopped breathing, but the rest of me didn't really care. A strand of moonlight broke away from the trees and glided toward me. I watched without interest, knowing it was a hallucination. As it got closer, it shimmered and changed shape, sometimes resembling a deer, sometimes a goat or a pony. A horn of light grew from its head as it regarded me with ancient golden eyes. Hello, Megan Chase. Hello, I replied, though my lips didn't move and I had no breath to speak. Am I dead? Not quite. The moonlight creature laughed softly, shaking its mane. It is not your destiny to die here, princess. Oh. I pondered that, my thoughts swirling muzzily in my head. How do you know who I am? The creature snorted, swishing a lion-like tail. Those of us who watch the sky have seen your coming for a long time, Megan Chase. Catalysts always burn brightly, and your light shines unlike any I've seen before. Now the only question remaining is, what path will you take, and how will you choose to rule? I don't understand. You aren't supposed to. The moonlight creature stepped forward and breathed. Silver air washed over me, and my eyelids fluttered shut. Now, sleep, my princess. Your father awaits you. And tell Grimalkin that I choose to help, not as a favor, but for reasons of my own. Next time he calls on me will be the last. I didn't want to sleep. Questions swirled to mind, buzzing and insistent. I opened my mouth to ask about my father, but the creature's horn touched my chest, sending a rush of heat through my body. I gasped and opened my eyes. The moonlit grove had disappeared. A meadow surrounded me, tall grasses waving in the wind, a faint pink glow lighting the horizon. The last traces of a weird dream fluttered across my mind. Moving trees, talking deer, a creature made of frost and moonlight. I wondered what was real and what had just been the effects of the delirium. I felt fine now, better than fine. Some of it must have been real. Then the grass rustled, as if something crept up behind me. I whipped around and saw my backpack sitting a few feet away, bright orange against the green. Snatching it up, I pulled it open. The food was gone, of course, as were the flashlight and the aspirin. But my extra clothes were there, crumpled into a ball and sopping wet. Confused, I stared at the pack, what could have brought it here all the way from the goblins' camp? I didn't think Grimalkin would have gone back for it, especially since that would have meant crossing the river again. But here was my pack, moldy and wet, but still here. At least the clothes would dry. And then I remembered something else, something that made me wince. Unzipping the side pouch, I pulled out my dripping, waterlogged iPod. Damn it! I sighed, looking it over. The screen was blurry and warped, totally ruined, a year's savings down the drain. I shook it and heard water sloshing inside. Not good. Just to be sure, I plugged in the headphones and turned it on. Nothing. Not even a buzz. It was well and truly dead. Sadly, I replaced it in the pocket and zipped it back up. So much for listening to Arrowsmith in Fairyland. I was about to go looking for Grimalkin when a giggle overhead made me glance up. Something crouched in the branches, something small and misshapen, watching me with glowing green eyes. I saw the outline of a sinewy body, long, thin arms, and goblin-like ears. Only it wasn't a goblin, it was too small for that, and more disturbing. It seemed intelligent. 
The monster saw me watching it and offered a slow smile. Its teeth, pointed and razor sharp, glimmered with neon blue fire just before it vanished. And I don't mean it scuttled off or faded away like a ghost. It blipped out of sight, like the image on a computer screen. Like that thing I saw in the computer lab. Definitely time to go. I found Grimalkin sunning himself on a rock, eyes shut, purring deep in his throat. He cracked open a lazy eye as I came rushing up. We're leaving, I told him, shrugging into my backpack. You're going to take me to Puck, I'm going to rescue Ethan, and we're going home. And if I never see another goblin, nixie, cat, she, or whatever, it'll be too soon. Grimalkin yawned. Infuriatingly, he took his sweet time getting up, stretching, yawning, scratching his ears, making sure every hair was in place. I stood, nearly dancing with impatience, wanting to grab him by the scruff of the neck, though I knew I'd probably be shredded for it. Arcadia. The summer court is close, Grimalkin said as he finally deemed himself ready to start. Remember, you owe me a small debt when we find your puck. He leaped from the rock to the ground, looking back at me solemnly. I will claim my price as soon as we find him. Don't forget. We walked for hours through a forest that seemed to be constantly closing in on us. In the corners of my eyes, branches, leaves, even tree trunks moved and shifted, reaching out for me. Sometimes I'd pass a tree or bush, only to see the same one farther down the path. Laughter echoed from the canopy overhead, and strange lights winked and bobbed in the distance. Once, a fox peeked at us from beneath a fallen log, a human skull perched on its head. None of this bothered Grimalkin, who trotted down the forest trail with his tail up, never looking back to see if I followed. Night had descended, and the enormous blue moon was high overhead when Grimalkin stopped, flattening his ears. With a hiss, he slipped off the trail and vanished into a patch of ferns. Startled, I looked up to see a pair of riders approaching, glowing bright in the darkness. Their mounts were gray and silver, and the hooves didn't touch the ground as they broke into a canter, straight for me. I stood my ground as they approached. There was no use trying to outrun hunters on horseback. As they got closer, I saw the riders. Tall and elegant, with sharp features and coppery hair tied into a tail. They wore silver mail that flashed in the moonlight and carried long, thin blades at their sides. The horses surrounded me, snorting steam, their breath hanging in the air like clouds. Atop their mounts, the knights glared down with unnatural beauty, their features too fine and delicate to be real. Are you Megan Chase? One of them asked, his voice high and clear like a flute. His eyes flashed the color of the summer sky. I swallowed. Yes? You will come with us. His Majesty King Oberon, Lord of the Summer Court, has sent for you. Chapter 9 In the Seely Court I rode in front of an elven knight who had one arm wrapped securely around my waist while the other held the reins. Grimalkin dozed in my lap, a warm, heavy weight, and refused to talk to me. The knights wouldn't answer any of my questions either. Where were we going, if they knew Puck, or why King Oberon wanted me? I didn't even know if I was a prisoner or a guest of these people, though I supposed I would find out soon enough. The horses flew over the forest floor, and I saw up ahead the trees were beginning to thin. We broke through the tree line, and ahead of us rose an enormous mound. It towered above us in ancient, grassy splendor, the pinnacle seeming to brush the sky. Thorny trees and brambles grew everywhere, especially near the top, so the whole thing resembled a large, bearded head. Around it grew a hedge bristling with thorns, some longer than my arm, the knights spurred their horses toward the thickest part of the hedge. 
I wasn't surprised when the brambles parted for them, forming an arc as they rode beneath, before settling back with a loud crunching sound. I was surprised when the horses rode straight at the side of the hill without slowing, and I clutched Grimalkin tightly, making him growl in protest. The mound neither opened up nor moved aside in any way. We rode into the hill and through, sending a shiver all the way down my spine to my toes. Blinking, I gazed around at total chaos. A massive courtyard stretched before me, a great circular platform of ivory pillars, marble statues, and flowering trees. Fountains hurled geysers of water into the air, multicolored lights danced over the pools, and flowers in the full spectrum of the rainbow bloomed everywhere. Strains of music reached my ears. A combination of harps and drums, strings and flutes, bells and whistles, somehow lively and melancholy at the same time. It brought tears to my eyes, and suddenly all I wanted to do was slide off the horse and dance until the music consumed me and I was lost in it. Thankfully, Grimalkin muttered something like, Get hold of yourself! and dug his claws into my wrist, snapping me out of it. Fairies were everywhere, sitting on the marble steps or benches, dancing together in small groups, or just wandering around. My eyes couldn't take it in fast enough. A man with a bare chest and shaggy legs ending in hooves winked at me from the shade of a bush. A willowy girl with green-tinted skin stepped out of a tree, scolding a child hanging from the branches. The boy stuck out his tongue, flicked his squirrel tail, and darted higher into the foliage. I felt a sharp tug on my hair. A tiny figure hovered near my shoulder, gossamer wings buzzing like a hummingbird's. I gasped, but the night holding me didn't so much as glance at it. She grinned and held out what looked like a plump grape, except the skin of the fruit was bright blue and speckled with orange. I smiled politely and nodded, but she frowned and pointed at my hand. Confused, I held up my palm. She dropped the fruit into it, gave a delightful giggle, and sped away. Be careful, Grimalkin rumbled, as a heady aroma rose from the little fruit, making my mouth water. Eating or drinking certain things in fairy could have unpleasant consequences for someone like you. Do not eat anything. In fact, until we find your puck... I would not talk to anyone, and whatever you do, do not accept gifts of any sort. This is going to be a long night. I swallowed and dropped the fruit into one of the fountains as we rode by, watching huge green and gold fish swarm around it, mouths gaping. The night scattered fairies as we rode through the courtyard toward a high stone wall with a pair of silver gates in front. Two massive creatures, each ten feet tall, Blue-skinned and tusked, guarded the doors. Their eyes glimmered yellow beneath ropey black hair and heavy brows. Even dressed up, their arms and chests bulging through the fabric of their red uniforms, popping the brass buttons, they were still terrifying. Trolls, muttered Grimalkin, as I shrank against the unyielding frame of the elven knight. Be thankful we're in Oberon's land. The winter court employs ogres. The knight stopped and let me down a few feet from the gate. Be courteous when you speak to the Earl King, child. The knight I'd ridden with told me and wheeled his mount away. I was left facing two giant trolls with nothing but a cat and my backpack. Grimalkin squirreled in my arms and I let him drop to the stones. Come on. The cat sighed, lashing his tail. Let us meet Lord Pointy Ears and get this over with. The two trolls blinked as the cat fearlessly approached the gate, looking like a gray bug scuttling around their clawed feet. One of them moved, and I braced myself, expecting him to stomp Grimalkin into kitty pudding. But the troll only reached over and pulled the gate open, as the other did the same on his side. Grimalkin shot me a backward glance, twisted his tail, and slipped through the archway. I took a deep breath smoothed down my tangled hair, and followed. 
the forest grew thick on the other side of the gates, as if the wall had been built to keep it in check. A tunnel of flowering trees and branches stretched away from me, fully in bloom, the scent so overpowering I felt lightheaded. The tunnel ended with a curtain of vines opening up into a vast clearing surrounded by giant trees. The ancient trunks and interlocking branches made a sort of cathedral, a living palace of giant columns and a leafy vaulted ceiling. Even though I knew we were underground and it was night outside, sunlight dappled the forest floor, slanting in through tiny cracks in the canopy. Glowing balls of light danced in the air and a waterfall cascaded gently into a nearby pool. The colors here were dazzling. A hundred fairies clustered around the middle of the clearing, dressed in brilliant alien finery. By the look of it, I guessed these were the nobles of the court. Their hair hung long and flowing, or was styled in impossible fashions atop their heads. Satyrs easily recognized by their shaggy goat legs, and furry little men padded back and forth serving drinks and trays of food. Slender hounds with moss-green fur milled about, hoping for dropped crumbs. Elven knights in silvery chain armor stood stiffly around the room. A few held hawks or even tiny dragons. In the center of this gathering sat a pair of thrones, seemingly grown out of the forest floor and flanked by two liveried centaurs. One of the thrones stood empty, except for a caged raven on one of the arms. The great black bird cawed and beat its wings against its prison, its beady eyes bright and green. However, in the throne on the left, King Oberon, for I could only assume this was him, sat with his fingers steepled together, gazing out at the crowd. Like the rest of the Fey nobles, he was tall and slender, with silver hair that fell to his waist and eyes like green ice. An antlered crown rested on his brow, casting a long shadow over the court like grasping talons. Power radiated from him, as subtle as a thunderstorm. Over the colorful sea of nobles, our gazes met. Oberon raised one eyebrow, graceful as the curve of a hawk's wing, but no expression showed on his face. And at that moment, every fairy in the room stopped what it was doing and turned to stare at me. Great, muttered Grimalkin, forgotten beside me. Now they all know we're here. Well, come on, human, let us play nices with the court. My legs felt weak, my mouth dry, but I forced myself to walk. Fay lords and ladies parted for me, but whether out of respect or disdain, I couldn't tell. Their eyes, cold and amused, gave nothing away. A green fairy hound sniffed me and growled as I passed. But other than that, the place was silent. What was I doing here? I didn't even know. Grimalkin was supposed to be leading me to Puck, but now Oberon wanted to see me. It seemed I was getting further and further from my goal of rescuing Ethan. Unless, of course, Oberon knew where Ethan was unless Oberon was holding him hostage. I reached the foot of the throne. Heart pounding, not knowing what else to do, I dropped to one knee and bowed. I felt the Earl King's eyes on the back of my neck, as ancient as the forest surrounding us. Finally, he spoke. Rise, Megan Chase. His voice was soft, Yet the lilting undertone made me think of roaring oceans and savage storms. The ground trembled beneath my fingers. Controlling my fear, I stood and looked at him, and saw something flicker across his mask-like face. Pride? Amusement? It was gone before I could tell. You have trespassed in our lands, he told me, sending a murmur down the fairy court. You were never meant to see the Never-Never, and yet you tricked a member of this court into bringing you across the barrier. Why? Not knowing what else to do, I told him the truth. I'm searching for my brother, sir. Ethan Chase. And you have reason to believe he is here? I don't know. 
I cast a desperate look at Grimalkin, who was grooming a back leg and paying no attention to me. My friend, Robbie? Puck? He told me that Ethan was kidnapped by fairies, that he left a changeling in his place. I see. Oberon turned his head slightly, regarding the caged bird on his throne. And that is yet another transgression, Robin. I gaped, my mouth dropping open. Puck? The raven looked at me with bright green eyes, cawed softly, and seemed to shrug. I glared back at Oberon. What are you doing to him? He was commanded never to bring you to our land. Oberon's voice was calm but pitiless. He was ordered to keep you blind to our ways, our life, our very existence. I punished him for his disobedience. Perhaps I will turn him back in a few centuries, after he has had time to think on his transgressions. He was trying to help me! Oberon smiled, but it was cold, empty. We immortals do not think of life in the same way as humans. Puck should have had no interest in rescuing a human child, especially if it conflicted with my direct orders. That he cave to your demands suggests he may be spending too much time with mortals, learning their ways and their capricious emotions. It is time he remembers how to be fey. I swallowed. But what about Ethan? I know not. Oberon leaned back, shrugging his lean shoulders. He is not here, within my territories. That much I can tell you. Despair crushed me like a ten-ton weight. Oberon didn't know where Ethan was, and worse, didn't care. Now I'd lost Puck as a guide as well. It was back to square one. I'd have to find the other court, the unsealy one, sneak in and rescue my brother, all by myself. That is, if I could get there in one piece. Maybe Grimalkin would agree to help me. I looked down at the cat, who was completely absorbed in washing his tail, and my heart sank. Probably not. Well, then, I was on my own. The enormity of my task loomed ahead, and I fought back tears. Where would I go now? How would I even survive? Fine. I didn't mean to sound surly, but I wasn't feeling very positive at the moment. I'll be leaving now. If you won't help me, I'll just have to keep looking. I'm afraid, said Oberon, that I can't let you go just yet. What? I recoiled. Why? Much of the land knows you are here, the Earl King continued. Outside this court, I have many enemies. Now that you are here, now that you are aware, they would use you to get to me. I'm afraid I cannot allow that. <laughs> I don't get it. I looked around at the Fey nobles. Many of them looked grim, unfriendly. The stares they leveled at me now glittered with disdain. I turned back to Oberon, pleading. Why would they want me? I'm just a human. I don't have anything to do with you people. I just want my brother back. On the contrary. Oberon sighed, and for the first time, age seemed to weigh him down. He looked old, still deadly and extremely powerful but ancient and tired. You are more connected to our world than you know, Megan Chase. You see, you are my daughter. Chapter 10 The Earl King's Daughter I stared at Oberon as the world fell away beneath me. The Earl King gazed back, his expression cool and unruffled, his eyes blank once more. The silence around us was absolute. I didn't see anyone except Oberon, 
the rest of the court faded into the background until we were the only two in the whole world. Puck gave an indignant caw and flapped his wings against the cage. That broke the spell. What? I choked out. The Earl King didn't so much as blink, which somehow infuriated me even more. That's not true. Mom was married to my dad. She stayed with him until he disappeared, and she remarried Luke. That is true, Oberon nodded. But that man is not your father, Megan. I am. He stood, his courtly robes billowing around him. You are half fae, half my blood. Why do you think I had Puck guard you, keep you from seeing our world? Because it comes naturally to you. Most mortals are blind, but you could see through the mist from the beginning. I thought back to all those times I saw something out of the corner of my eye or silhouetted in the trees, glimpses of things not quite there. I shook my head. No, I don't believe you. My mom loved my dad. She wouldn't... I broke off, not wanting to think about the implications. Your mother was a beautiful woman, Oberon continued softly and quite extraordinary for a mortal. Artistic people can always see a bit of the fey world around them. She would often go to the park and paint and draw. It was there, beside the pond, that we first met. Stop it, I gritted out. You're lying. I'm not one of you. I can't be. Only half, Oberon said and from the corner of my eye I caught looks of disgust and contempt from the rest of the court. Still, that is enough for my enemies to attempt to control me through you, or perhaps to turn you against me. You are more dangerous than you know, daughter. Because of the threat you represent, you must remain here. My world seemed to be collapsing around me. For how long? I whispered, thinking of Mom, Luke, school, everything I left behind in my world. Had I been missed already? Would I return to find a hundred years had passed while I was gone, and everyone I knew was long dead? Until I deem otherwise, Oberon said, in the tone my mother often used when she settled the matter, because I said so. At the very least, until Elysium is through. The winter court will be arriving in a few days, and I will have you where I can see you. He clapped, and a female satyr broke away from the crowd to bow before him. Take my daughter to her room, he ordered, sitting back on his throne. See that she is made comfortable. Yes, my lord, murmured the satyr, and began to clop away, glancing back to see if I was coming. Oberon leaned back, not looking at me, his face blank and stony. My audience with the Earl King was over. I had stumbled back, prepared to follow the goat girl out of the court, when Grimalkin's voice floated up from the ground. I'd completely forgotten about the cat. Begging your pardon, my lord. Grimalkin said, sitting up and curling his tail around himself. But our business is not yet complete. You see, the girl is in my debt. She promised me a favor for bringing her safely here, and that obligation has yet to be paid. I glared at the feline, wondering why it was bringing that up now. Oberon, however, looked at me with a grim expression. Is this true? I nodded, wondering why the nobles were giving me looks of horror and pity. Grim helped me escape the goblins, I explained. He saved my life. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for... My voice trailed off as I saw the look in Oberon's eyes. A life debt, then. He sighed. Very well, Cat-she. What would you have of me? 
Grimalkin lowered his eyelids. It was easy to see that the cat was purring. A small favor, great lord, he rumbled, to be called in at a later time. Granted. The Earl King nodded, and yet he seemed to grow bigger in his chair. His shadow loomed over the cat, who blinked and flattened his ears. Thunder growled overhead, the light in the forest dimmed, and a cold wind rattled the branches in the trees, showering us with petals. The rest of the court shrank away. Some vanished from sight completely. In the sudden darkness, Oberon's eyes glowed amber. But be warned, feline, he boomed, his voice making the ground quiver. I am not to be trifled with. Do not think to make a fool of me, for I can grant your request in insurmountably unpleasant ways. Of course, great Earl King, Grimalkin soothed, his fur whipping about in the gale. I am always your servant. It would be foolish indeed to trust the flattering words of a cat she. Oberon leaned back, his face an expressionless mask once more. The wind died down, the sun returned, and things were normal again. You have your favor. Now go. Grimalkin bowed his head, turned, and trotted back to me, bottle brush tail held high. What was that about, Grim? I demanded, scowling at the feline. I thought you wanted a favor from me. What was all that with Oberon? Grimalkin didn't so much as pause. Tail up, he passed me without comment, slipped into the tunnel of trees, and vanished from sight. The satyr touched my arm. This way, she murmured, and led me away from the court. I felt the eyes of the nobles and the hounds on my back as we left the presence of the Earl King. I don't understand, I said miserably, following the satyr girl across the clearing. My brain had gone numb. I felt a wash in a sea of confusion, moments away from drowning. I just wanted to find my brother. How had it come to this? The satyr gave me a sympathetic glance. She was shorter than me by a foot, with large hazel eyes that matched her curly hair. I tried to keep my eyes away from her furry lower half, but it was difficult, especially when she smelled faintly like a petting zoo. It is not so bad, she said, leading me not through the tunnel, but to a far side of the clearing. The trees here were so thick the sunlight didn't permeate the branches, shadowing everything in emerald darkness. You might enjoy it here. Your father does you a great honor. He's not my father, I snapped. She blinked wide, liquid brown eyes, and her lower lip quivered. I sighed, regretting my harsh tone. Sorry. It's just a lot to take in. Two days ago, I was home, sleeping in my own bed. I didn't believe in goblins or elves or talking cats, and I certainly didn't ask for any of this. King Oberon took a great chance for you, the satyr said, her voice a bit firmer. The cat she held a life debt over you, which meant it could have asked for anything. My lord Oberon took it and made it his, so Grimalkin can't request you to poison anyone or to give up your first child. I recoiled in horror. He would have? Who knows what goes on in the mind of a cat? The satyr shrugged, picking her way over a tangle of roots. Just be careful what you say around here. If you make a promise, you're bound to it, and wars have been fought over small favors. Be especially careful around the high lords and ladies. They are all adept at the game of politics and pawn-making. She suddenly paled and put a hand to her mouth. I've said too much. Please forgive me. If that gets back to King Oberon... I won't say anything, I promised. She looked relieved. I am grateful, Megan Chase. Others might have used that against me. I am still learning the ways of the court. What is your name? Tansy. Well, 
You're the only one who has treated me nicely without expecting anything in return, I told her. Thank you. She looked embarrassed. Truly, you do not need to put yourself in my debt, Megan Chase. Here, let me show you to your room. We were standing at the edge of the trees. A wall of flowering bramble, so thick I couldn't see to the other side, loomed above us. Between the pink and purple flowers, thorns bristled menacingly. Tansy reached out and brushed one of the petals. The hedge shuddered, then curled in and rearranged itself, forming a tunnel not unlike the one leading into the court. At the end of the prickly tube stood a small red door. In a daze, I followed Tansy into the briar tunnel and through the door as she opened it for me. Inside, a dazzling bedroom greeted my eyes. The floor was white marble, inlaid with patterns of flowers, birds, and animals. Under my disbelieving stare, some of them moved. A fountain bubbled in the middle of the room, and a small table stood nearby covered with cakes, tea, and bottles of wine. A massive, silk-covered bed dominated one wall, while a fireplace stood at the other. The flame...